Welcome back to the channel. This is Trade Storm, and you are watching first part of What If Neglected Naruto Was Trained by a Dark Sorcerer. If you enjoy this video, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Now, wasting no more time, let's start the story. End of life. This is such a simple word, but it has so much power. Although some say that death is the end of all living things, others say that it is just the start of a new adventure. Still others say that death is a release, a way to get away from the sins and pain that someone else causes you or the pain that you cause others. One of these people is the man who is floating in a place that can only be described as empty space, since all that could be seen was darkness. To go back to the man who was floating in this endless void, he is a young man with short black hair and black eyes who wears a small circle. Shaped necklace around his neck. His black and tan robes have gold trim around the edges, and he wears a big, flowing white toga around his middle. People who don't know this man would think he's strange, but those who do know him say that just being around him can make even the bravest warriors scared. This man's name will go down in history as one of the most powerful and evil people ever. This is the Dark Lord Zareph, the monster that people call it. Is this the place where my soul will rest for good? Was Zareph's thought right before he remembered all the bad things he did and how his sad life ended because of them? END. Such a cursed existence. You might never forgive me, but I am truly sorry. Natsu, the powerful mage said softly. He then closed his eyes and accepted that he would never be anything again in the void where he was floating. A strong voice that seemed to be heard everywhere asked Zareph, would you like a chance to make up for your sins? Zareph's eyes popped open quickly in shock. He had been thinking that he would be stuck in this void by himself for all time. Who are you? Zareph asked in a dull voice that showed a bit of interest. The scary voice spoke again, I have had a lot of names Dark Mage. Some see me as evil itself, while others believe I am a necessary force, but I am neither. I'm what your kind would call a god. I am the Shinigami. Zareph was shocked for a second when he realized who the voice was. The god of death came to punish Zareph's soul for the bad things he had done and for making other people do bad things. Zareph spoke softly, ready to accept whatever punishment the god of death would give him. He knew he deserved every punishment this god could give him. That is the task that Kami gave me. However it is not normal for me to pay special attention to anyone's soul, but for you, someone whose evil deeds brought the complete destruction of his own world, I was tasked to curse your soul and give you eternal punishment, said the Shinigami, his voice completely empty of emotion. Zareph was ready for something like that to happen, so the news didn't surprise him at all. But what the Shinigami said next did. But, the god of death said, unlike my stupid sister who sees you as nothing but a mistake, I see someone that could be useful to me. This made Zareph wonder what the god of death was talking about. Wasn't he going to be punished? What do you want to talk about? I'm telling you that there is a better way for you to accept your sins. There's a better way to help you than to just punish you, Zareph, the Shinigami said, waiting to see if the little person would take him up on his offer. Is that right? Oh no, there is no way like that. I have done too many bad things for me to be forgiven. Don't joke with me, Shinigami, Zareph said, and there was a hint of anger in his voice. He thought that the god of death was joking with him to avoid punishment and have fun instead. Hum, don't forget who you're talking to. Do you really think I'd waste my time with you like this? I could just send your soul to hell for all time and be done with you, but I think you're too useful to leave that way. So I'll make you a deal. You can either accept your fate and suffer forever for your sins, or you can. You can either do what I tell you to do to make up for your mistakes, the Shinigami said again, hoping that the human would agree. After all, souls as interesting as his weren't common. The Shinigami knew that by doing this, he was breaking Kami's order, but he didn't care, he was tired of letting things happen on their own, but he also knew that he couldn't mess with humans unless they called him, which didn't happen very often. While the Shinigami was waiting for an answer, Zareph couldn't stop thinking about what the God of Death had said. Was there really a way for Zareph to make up for his crimes? All of a sudden, Zareph felt a strange emotion, hope. Hope that there was a way he could make up for all the lives he and his demons, END, had destroyed. Hope that he could be forgiven if he did what the Shinigami told him to do. What's your answer, people? Will you make things right, or will you bless your soul for all time? Asked the Shinigami one last time, hoping that this little dark lord would give a good answer. Aye. If it's really possible to do it that way, then. I will do everything I can to make it happen. 
I don't care if people never forgive me for what I did. In order to find peace with myself, Zarif said, this time with more passion in his voice than ever before. Suddenly, the space around him went cold, and a ghostly figure began to appear. The figure was bigger than Zarif, had long white hair, a face that could only be described as demonic, and a tonto between his fangs. It only took Zarif a second to figure out that the figure was the Shinigami himself. He hadn't thought that before. Alright, Zarif, the man who destroyed his own world and made END are you ready to change the strings of fate? In Zarif's mind, the answer was crystal clear. Yes. Hikaru no Sato, nine years after the Kyubi attack. Nine years have passed since that terrible night when the powerful Biju called the Kyubi no Yoko attacked the village of Konoha, destroying it almost completely and killing most of the people who lived there. The beast was only stopped by the actions of the Yandaimi Hokage, Minato Namikaze. The Yandaimi knew that killing a Biju was nearly impossible, so he did the only thing that could kill it, he put it inside the body of a newborn child. Because the Yandaimi is such a kind person, he couldn't ask any other family to give up their children. So, he sealed the Biju, tailed beast, in his triplet newborns. He put the Ying part of the chakra into his only daughter, Uzumaki. Namikaze Mito, and the Yang part of the chakra into the youngest of the triplets, Uzumaki. Namikaze Menma. In order to do something so amazing, the Yandaimi had to use the powerful Shiki Fujin, dead demon consuming seal, to call upon the Shinigami and offer to split the Kyubi in exchange for his own soul. Minato was ready to die to protect the village he loves, knowing that his wife Uzumaki Kashina would be able to care for the kids even without him. So imagine his shock when the Shinigami told him that foe. On the same day, the Yandaimi told everyone that the village had been saved by his two children, Menma and Mito, who were able to contain the chakra of the powerful beast. Minato told everyone that his children were heroes and shouldn't be thought of as some kind of reincarnated Kiyubi. Everyone in the village believed him and started calling Menma and Mito the saviors of Konoha. Now, nine years later, this day wasn't sad and full of grief. There was a big festival to honor the defeat of the Kiyubi, and it was also the birthdays of the heroes of Konoha. People were celebrating all over the village, but the real party was at the Namikaze. Uzumaki home, where Mito and Menma, who were now nine years old, were having their birthday party. The Namikaze. Uzumaki clan's house wasn't as big as the other clan houses, but it was big enough to fit all the guests who came to the party. Among them were the heads of all the important clans in the village, along with their next heirs and some important family members, like Kakashi Hitaki, Hirazen Serutobi, Jiraiya, and Tsunade Senju of the Sani. The party was going at full blast and everyone was having a good time, but the ones that were most happy were of course Menma and Mito. Menma Uzumaki Namikaze could only be described as a miniature version of Minato, with his spiky blonde hair and blue eyes, although his personality was more like that of his mother, Kashina Uzumaki. After all, it was hard for the boy to not pull a prank at someone when he could. In contrast to him his sister, Mito Uzumaki. Namikaze, is a carbon copy of her mother, with long red hair that reached to the middle of her back and violet eyes. Although her personality was more like Minato, calm and collected. Alongside the two birthday kids was another little girl, this one looking like she was six or seven years of age. She had red hair just like her sister, with the only difference being that hers was put into twin tails, and she has blue eyes, just like her father. This girl is no other than the fourth child of the Namikaze. Uzumaki Household, Natsumi Uzumaki. Namikaze. The youngest redhead was nothing short of a bundle of joy, always having fun with her family and with a smile on her face all the time. Yes, this scene makes it look like they are the perfect family, but of course nothing is perfect. For example, no one noticed that the third. Greater wasn't even close to the house on his birthday. At the same time, on the Hokage Monument. While everyone else was having a great time, there was one little boy who felt nothing but sadness and pain. He had blonde hair with spikes, sky, blue eyes, and three whisker marks on each cheek, which made him look very different. The blonde was wearing a black shirt with a red spiral symbolizing his clan and white shorts. He was Naruto Uzumaki. Namikaze, the third child of Uzumaki and Namikaze. You might be wondering why someone like him is here by himself and feeling so sad. The reason is simple, his family has forgotten about him again, just like they do every year. They are celebrating his brother and sister's birthdays but not his. Why does this keep happening? Why did my family forget my birthday again? Why do they never notice me? Do they hate me?
were the thoughts going through the young blonde's mind at the moment. Just thinking about his family hating him made him cry. His family had always treated him differently. His brother and sister got praise for almost everything they did, but he barely got them to notice him. They never pay attention to him. Menma and Mito had already started training to be ninjas, but he hadn't. Every time he asked, his parents would tell him, we need to focus on teaching your sibling how to control the Kiyubi's chakra, so we can't do that right now. When his little sister was born, he thought he would finally have someone who would treat him like family, but it didn't happen. Because Natsumi could use the Uzumaki chakra chains, which was something only his mother could do, his parents decided to start training her earlier, leaving him out of the family training time. Not only did his parents ignore him, but so did his siblings. Menma was always a spoiled brat and told him how weak he was and that his parents loved him more. His sister Mito was always cold to him. She started being that way two years ago and now barely talks to him and when she does, it's only for a few words. His little sister Natsumi was the most annoying because she was always telling him how cool something new she had learned. The village had forgotten that he was part of that family, not just his family. Some of the less smart people there thought he was the Kiyubi come back to life because of his whisker marks. Thoughts of his family were so strong that Naruto didn't notice that someone was walking toward him until that person spoke to him in a soft, emotionless voice. Kid, why are you here? Naruto was shocked when the person spoke. He hadn't thought anyone would be here at this time. The first thing that struck him about the man was his strange clothes and the way his hair and eyes made him look like a Uchiha. It took him a moment to understand what the question was, but when he did, he answered with a sad voice. I have nowhere else to be, Naruto said. He didn't know why he was answering, but he thought this strange. Looking man wouldn't hurt him like some of the villagers did. Aren't your family members waiting for you? He asked softly, is it not late after all? His black eyes were fixed on the child and nothing else. He knew the answer because he had seen the boy interact with his family for a while, but he wanted to lie to himself and answer anyway, just to see how much pain he was in his heart. I have a family, but. They've never cared about me, and every year they forget my birthday. Naruto told the man, no one cares about me. His voice was hurtful, and tears were in his eyes to show that he was right. The young boy's family was causing him too much pain, and now it was his turn to act. I see. No one should have to live like that, especially a child like you, the man said as he put his hand on the boy's head. The boy looked at him with a face that showed more surprise than sadness, but the man spoke again before Naruto could ask him anything. Tell me Naruto. Kun. The blonde was even more shocked that the man knew who he was. Want to make changes in your life? What are you looking at? The man asked softly, his black eyes looking right into Naruto's blue ones. Naruto felt like the man was looking into his soul. What are you talking about? Why do you ask that? Naruto asked with doubt in his voice. But for some reason, he wasn't scared of this man. It was like he knew this person wasn't going to hurt him. Naruto. Kun, I want to know if you want to change. Would you like to be so strong that you never feel so weak again? Naruto. Kun, would you like to have someone care for you so you never have to be alone? He looked at the man like he was crazy after hearing these words, but there was still a bit of hope in his blue eyes. That's how I can change. Why do you ask? Naruto asked the man with black hair, as if he knew everything. We can always change, Naruto. Kun, but that path is never easy. I ask you again, Naruto. Kun. Do you want to stay this way, being treated like nothing by your family and like a monster by this village, or would you like to become something more? He knew that the young blonde's next word would be very important, so he asked her. Naruto's thoughts were racing. This man was offering him a chance to never feel so weak and alone again. Part of him told him not to trust someone he barely knew and that his family would change if he stayed with them, but a bigger part wanted to accept this man's offer and answered. I need to. For my family to see that I can be strong too, I want to change. I want to show myself that I can become someone. No doubt about it, Naruto said, his voice filled with conviction. The man smiled a little, but Naruto couldn't see it because his face quickly went back to its neutral look. Alright. From now on, I'll teach you everything I know, but it's up to you to learn it, the man said as he knelt down and put his hand on the floor. Naruto gave him a strange look, but he wasn't upset because he was finally going to learn how to be strong from someone. But then he had a thought that stopped him in his tracks. Wait. Naruto said, Sensei, 
I don't know your name. He had just realized that his new sensei had never introduced himself. Sorry, I forgot. There were many names and titles for me, but you can just call me Naruto. Kun. Just as the man was about to say his name, a strange black circle appeared under both Naruto and the man. Naruto almost freaked out, but he wasn't because he had never heard of this kind of jutsu before. He looked away from the circle and saw the man say the name that would stay with him forever. Zarif. After that, they were gone in an instant. After 11 years, Konohagakure no Sato appears in the form of. People in Konoha would probably think the person was crazy if they said there was a magical circle in a hidden part of the Hokage monument that, when activated with magic, led to a secret training area that not even the Hokage knew about. People would think magic didn't exist. Sadly for them, there is such a place. The place in question was big, but very basic. It only had stone walls and a big magical circle that went around the whole floor. There was no sunlight in this training room, so torches built into each wall lit the room. There were only two people in this room at the moment. They were the same people who had trained here for two years before. One of the figures was a tall man with dark black hair and eyes that were even darker. He was dressed in clothes that most people would think were weird. This person is called Zarif, and he is looking at the other figure who has spent a lot of time in this training room over the last two years. The figure in question was definitely a man. He had spiky blonde hair with two bangs that framed his face. He also had deep blue eyes and whisker marks on each cheek. He was wearing a simple black long. Sleeved shirt with a silver symbol on the back that looked like the head of a dragon. It was very different from what his sensei was wearing. He also had on blue ninja sandals and black cargo pants. He was tall for his age, and his body was fit from working out every day for two years. Naruto Uzumaki. Namikaze was this boy's real name. He was the first son of Minato Namikaze and Kashina Uzumaki and an apprentice of the Dark Lord Zarif. There were holes in Naruto's clothes, and he was sweating like there was no tomorrow. He was hunched over and breathing hard. The young blonde usually looked like this after sparring with his sensei. Zarif, on the other hand, looked perfect, like nothing had happened, which shows how much worse their skills were. He asked Naruto. Kun, are you ready for a break? In a soft voice, as emotionless as ever. Even though it was tough, the dark mage already knew the answer. His apprentice was the type to train until he could no longer move. No. I can still go on. Sensei, Naruto said in between breaths as he slowly stood up, ready to fight his sensei again. But he thought it was more like a one. Sided beating because he could never hit his sensei, and when he did, Zarif would just walk away like nothing happened. Zarif said, if you say so. And then moved so quickly that Naruto couldn't see him knee him in the stomach. The young blonde fell again, and Naruto tried to get some air by holding his stomach. Zarif told Naruto straight out, you should know when to rest already. Your dedication is admirable, but sometimes it's more stupid than anything else. This made Naruto groan in irritation. The evil wizard went back to the middle of the field and began to meditate. All the while, his apprentice lay on his back in pain, and the last hit didn't help at all. Zarif told his apprentice again, it's been two years, and you still won't rest when I tell you to. You're too stubborn for your own good. This time, his apprentice looked from the ceiling to Zarif. Yes, that's right. It's been two years since I met him, Naruto thought as he remembered the day Zarif took him on as an apprentice. Naruto smiled at the thought of it because it reminded him of the first day he trained with Zarif and learned that he was a mage in his world. That day was one he would never forget for sure. Two years ago, the day after the Kyubi festival. Naruto groaned as he woke up. He thought yesterday had been the best birthday he had ever had. This was likely because he had finally met someone who cared about him and was giving him a chance to get stronger. And that thought made Naruto jump out of bed as fast as a boy his age could. He then looked around the room he was in, which was clearly not his bedroom. There was only a bed, a desk, a closet, and two doors in this room. One of the doors led to the bathroom. The blonde young woman left the room and went down a long hallway that was lit by torches. Naruto thought, this is really creepy. He wasn't sure if his new sensei really did live in this strange place. 
Naruto walked for a short time and then found himself in a very large room that was also lit by torches and had a strange looking circle covering the whole floor. What could the young Uzumaki say, though, before he could? A voice behind him that made him very happy. Zarif said in his usual emotionless voice, it looks like you're finally awake, Naruto. Kun. Good, I need to tell you a few things before we start doing anything. This made Naruto wonder what he was going to say. He really hoped that training with this man was a good idea. Zarif was still new to him, but he felt like he could trust this man, so he took shaky steps to follow his new sensei to the middle of the big room. Though Naruto did nothing but wait for someone to say something, Zarif just sat down on the floor and began to meditate. It was really awkward for a while, but Naruto finally broke the ice, so. Zarif. Sensei, when are you going to teach me how to be a ninja? The young blonde asked, a little more excited about the chance to become a strong ninja. However, Zarif's next words pretty much put an end to that dream. I'm not going to teach you how to be a ninja Naruto. Kun, Zarif said softly. He opened his eyes to see how his new apprentice reacted, and it was exactly what he thought it would be, priceless. His mouth opened and closed, but no words came out. His eyes were huge. The young blonde didn't really calm down until a minute later. He was then able to speak, though his voice was rough. While pointing at Zarif with his index finger, Naruto almost yelled, W. What do you am? Mean by that sensei? You told me you were going to teach me everything you know. Or was that nothing but a lie? The dark mage could only sigh at his apprentice's reaction. He knew it was normal for a young boy to yell like that when he was upset, but that didn't mean he had to like it. You should know that I never said I would teach you how to be a ninja. I did say I would teach you everything I know, though. B. But then what are you going to teach me? Naruto yelled again, but Zarif's answer really shut him up. Zarif replied, I'm going to teach you magic, as if it were the most obvious thing in the world. All of a sudden, there was silence. What Naruto was going to say got stuck in his throat when Zarif spoke. Sensei and student both looked at each other blankly for a moment. Of course, it was the young blonde who had to break the ice again. Was that meant to be funny? When Naruto looked at his new teacher like he was crazy, he said, because if it was, it was a really bad one, sensei. Zarif could only sigh at this reaction, but he thought it was normal, so he would just have to prove what he was talking about. Perhaps a little demonstration is needed, Zarif said as he stretched out his arm and opened his palm. Before Naruto could say anything else about his sensei's mental state, a small black ball appeared in Zarif's hand. Naruto was amazed, and he was even more amazed when Zarif threw the black ball at one of the walls. When the black mass of magic hit the wall, it caused a big explosion that shook the whole room. I asked, what kind of jutsu was that? Are you sure that the spell wasn't something weird that his sensei made? Naruto asked. What Naruto? Kun saw wasn't a jutsu move. It was magic, Zarif replied, getting ready for the many questions Naruto would have. But that can't happen, magic doesn't exist. It's not possible, right? No, Naruto said, sounding a little unsure at the end. Zarif sighed again and motioned for Naruto to sit down on the ground. This might take a while Naruto. Kun, but I will explain everything to you. Zarif told Naruto everything, from how he was from another world and was brought here to make things right to how magic worked in his world. All the while, Naruto paid full attention to Zarif and sometimes asked questions or made comments about certain things. Zarif didn't want to lie to his new apprentice, so he chose not to tell him that his world had been destroyed by people he had created, at least not for now. He was afraid. At the end of the story, Zarif had to say that Naruto's understanding was impressive. Naruto not only understood everything Zarif said, but he also said some pretty deep things about magic. Zarif did nothing after Naruto finished explaining everything. He was waiting to see if the blonde would ask anything else, which she did after a moment of thought. But sensei, I don't have a magic stone in my body. How can I learn magic? Naruto asked, still thinking about what Zarif had said. He had to admit that his new sensei's story sounded really crazy, but since he showed some magic while talking, he had no choice but to believe it. That didn't mean that the young blonde didn't have any more questions, though. What did his sensei do in his old world that made him want to correct it so badly? And how exactly was he sent to this world? 
You're right, Naruto. Kun. No one in this world can learn how to use magic because they don't have a magic container full of magical power. It's the same way that I can't use any jutsu because I don't have any chakra in me. This world also doesn't have a Thernano, which is needed to refill a mage's magic container after using magic, Zareph replied. He didn't seem to care about this problem at all, though, because he already had a plan for Naruto to use magic, though it might take a while to work. But how will I learn it if I can't use it? If there is no Athernano in this world, how are you going to fill up your magical container, Sensei? That's what Naruto asked again. Don't worry about that, Naruto. Kun. I promise that you will be able to use magic when the time is right. Just trust me. Regarding your second question, I have discovered a third type of chakra that comes from nature. After a lot of trial and error, I was able to use that natural energy to refill my magic container by meditating, Zeref replied, remembering some of the stranger things that had occurred when he was experimenting with natural energy. The Dark Lord was going to remember those days forever. What are you going to teach me now? First, Naruto. Kun, we'll train your body, mind, and spirit. Naruto. Kun, I want to remind you that once we start, we can't go back. Got it? Zeref said just as the big magical circle on the floor flashed with energy, lighting up the whole room with purple light. Naruto looked at the circle in surprise, but then he looked into his sensei's eyes, knowing that this man was trying to figure out if he was going to doubt or second. Guess his choice. But the young blonde had already made up his mind that he was going to get strong, and it didn't matter if he learned magic instead of jutsu, so that. Yes. So the training began. Remembering that day made Naruto start thinking about the training regime that his sensei had created especially for him, starting with every day after breakfast, which Naruto always ate alone in his bedroom before his family woke up, he would run to the Hokage monument where Zeref would be waiting for him to activate the magical circle and teleport them both his secret training room. There they would simply start training, from Mondays to Wednesday they would do nothing but physical training, which had not only given Naruto a top notch physical condition, but also made sure that his reflexes and pain tolerance were just as good. To make things harder, Naruto's clothes had a spell that would make them feel a lot heavier than they really were while he was on the training room, and he was not allowed to take them off while he was here. Now on Thursday and Fridays it would be nothing but combat training, in which Zeref would teach him his own combat style along with other styles that he knew just to see which style suited Naruto better, and after that the two of them would spar, meaning Zeref would kick Naruto's ass like there would be no tomorrow while the blonde complained about how unfair that was. Zeref may have not liked to fight with his fists, but that did not mean he wasn't a master at hand. 2. Hand combat, something that Naruto's bruised body could testify to. Saturday, the last day of training, was the calmest because all they did was play games like Shoji or Zeref would put his apprentice in different war. Like situations and tell him how to win. After that, they would sit and meditate, which Naruto wasn't very good at at first, and Zeref would hit him in the head every time he moved or made a sound, which got him a lot of curses. Zeref told Naruto that he could do anything on Sundays, but he couldn't come to the training room. That's why Naruto usually spent his free time doing chakra exercises in an empty training ground. Zeref told him that just because he would be learning magic, he shouldn't forget about jutsus completely, because being able to use both was an advantage that Naruto shouldn't give up, so Naruto spent a lot of his free time doing cha. In the beginning, Naruto wasn't sure if he could use magic because he didn't have a magic container like his sensei did. But Zeref's attack on him just a year after he started training took away all of his doubts. That was the day he finally turned into a mage. A room hidden in the hills, Zeref's training center, a year ago. Naruto, the young blonde, was walking down the hall that led to the training room. He was thinking about what his sensei wanted. Since they started training, his sensei had never asked him to come on a Sunday, so whatever he wanted was probably going to be big. When the young apprentice finally got to the training room, his sensei was sitting in the middle, meditating, just like he always was. Naruto always wondered if Zeref did something else besides train him and meditate, since that's all he had seen him do since they met. Just as Naruto walked into the room, he could feel how heavy his clothes were getting. It didn't bother him much at this point, though. Naruto sighed and thought, which means they are going to get heavier soon. He already knew what it would feel like when that happened. The young blonde apprentice walked up to his sensei and sat down, waiting for Zeref to tell him something. The dark mage opened his eyes and looked at his apprentice's eyes again, 
but this time Naruto felt like he was staring into his soul, just like the first time they met. You ask me how you were going to use magic. Do you remember what I told you? Naruto nodded his head in agreement as Zarif asked in a soft voice. Well, I think you're finally ready, Naruto. Kun. After today, you'll be able to use magic like I can, Zarif said. Naruto looked surprised as he tried to figure out what his sensei had just said. Oh my god. How, though? What is this? Naruto asked, hoping that his sensei wasn't pulling a joke on him. He had never seen Zarif tell a joke or even laugh, but as the saying goes, there were first times for everything. Naruto. Kun, I finally finished making what you could call an artificial magical container. It took me a while, but I got it done in the end. Today I'm going to fuse my creation with your body. I want to make sure that the process doesn't hurt your chakra network. Part of the reason you've been training so hard physically is that if I had done this a year ago, you would probably be dead or have had your chakra network destroyed, which would have done a lot of damage to your body. Zarif told him this calmly, knowing that what he was about to do could go badly if he wasn't careful. What steps did you take to make that? That being said, even if it works, there is still the problem of filling that magical container with Etherano, Naruto said with a lot more calmness than he really felt. Zarif had taught him how to control his emotions, telling him that it was an important part of the training because magic was based on emotions and accidents could happen if he didn't learn how to keep them in check. I used the Kuroi Geijutsu, which are the highest form of dark magic, to make it. I won't tell you how to make it because the Kuroi Geijutsu, black arts, is one of the strongest and least understood types of magic there is, and someone as young as you shouldn't know about them, Zarif said. When he talked about this kind of dark magic, Zarif's emotionless voice got a little rough, which made Naruto flinch. I'm sorry, Naruto. Kun, but I should never have learned that kind of magic. But I did, and it's only brought me sadness ever since. This is the first time I've used that magic to make something that doesn't make me feel bad, Zarif said softly, calming Naruto down again. Naruto wondered how strong that kind of magic was if even his sensei felt that way about it. In theory, even if I put a magical container in your body, it won't be able to fill itself because there is no etherano in this world. The second question you asked is true. But I was able to fix that. When I fuse the magical container with your body, I'll change your chakra network so that it feeds your magical container. Since this magical container is something I made, I made it so that it turns the chakra it gets into etherano, which lets you use magic, Zarif said. His apprentice was shocked and amazed that his sensei could make something like that. Now lie on your back. This procedure is going to be long and hard, and it's probably going to hurt like nothing else you felt, Zarif said as he walked to the far end of the room where a small box was. Naruto did what he was told, and as soon as he did, Black chains appeared from the ground and wrapped around all of his limbs, stopping him from moving at all. What the hell is this kind of teacher? He yelled and tried to move his arms and legs, but the chains were too tight, so he ended up flopping around on his stomach. Noob, you can't move around while I do this. Something bad could happen. It's going to hurt you a lot, but it's the only way, Zarif said with a frown on his face because he knew he was about to cause his apprentice the worst pain of his life. Sadly, there was no other way for this to work for either of them, but mostly for Naruto. Zarif opened the wooden box he was holding and took out what looked like a simple glass sphere with an arcane symbol on one side. Suddenly, the magical circle in the floor appeared. Naruto would always remember that day because it was both the day he learned how to use magic and the day he was in the most pain he never had before. It had been like that all day, and Naruto had passed out in the middle because he was so hurt. At the end, Zarif was even panting because the process had made his magic weaker. After that, Naruto had never been so tired. His whole body felt so weak that he couldn't even walk straight. Zarif told him that it was just his body getting used to it and that his chakra would be low until his magic container was fully charged. He also told him that he wouldn't be training next week and that he should just stay home and rest, which Naruto couldn't even muster the strength to complain about. Everything was well worth it, though, because Naruto could now use magic like a mage from his sensei's world. Too bad Zarif hadn't taught him any real spells. He had only shown him how to feel and release his magic. Zarif had to wait for Naruto's chakra network and magical container to stabilize before teaching him anything. This was because Naruto's body was still too unstable after the surgery, so the training stayed the same for a while, with lessons about letting out his own magic added every few days. What's on your mind, Naruto? Kun? 
Naruto was thinking about the past when Zarif spoke up and stopped him. Nothing, just thinking about everything that you taught me these past two years. The blonde always had that subject on her mind, so Zarif told her, I see. I know you want to learn spells already Naruto. Kun, but don't worry, your patience will be rewarded when the time comes. Naruto mumbled, yeah, I know. That doesn't mean I have to like it though. He tried to sound like his sensei, but his voice was too emotionless. They thought about things in silence for a while, with one meditating and the other just taking it easy until Zarif decided it was time to end the day. Zarif told him, you should go home already Naruto. Kun, it's getting late, and he could tell that his pupil was ticked off. While talking about his family, the young Uzumaki always had a cold and distant tone. I already told you sensei, it doesn't matter if I'm late or not, no one is waiting for me anyway, he said. Even after two years, his family still didn't care about him. His parents ignored him all the time, and his siblings talked about him like he was trash. Over the past two years, all the hurt and sadness he had been feeling slowly turned into anger and a little self. Pity. After all, what kind of parent forgets about their child? Which siblings make you feel like you're not as important as dirt? Zarif wisely told Naruto, I know how you feel about your family, but you shouldn't let hate fill your heart. If you do, you'll end up on a path that will bring you nothing but death and despair. He knew that hate could turn anyone into a monster. Naruto just nodded and stood up to leave. He could now use magic, so he could turn on the magic circle in the Hokage monument and the one in his room. But before he could go into the hallway and into his bedroom, Zarif said some more words that would have a big impact on Naruto's life in the years to come. I remember hearing that family is more than just people you share a last name or blood with. As Zirf thought back to what a certain short blonde guild master had said, that family is made up of people you would gladly protect with your life. And that is the way to true power, through those bonds. Naruto nodded again and didn't even look back. He then started walking back to his bedroom, where the magical circle was, with Zarif's words still fresh in his mind. When Naruto got to the house where his family lived, the moon was already very high in the sky. His refusal to call this place home was because it didn't even remotely call or comfort him. Zarif's training room seemed more like a home to him than this place. There was happy eating going on in the background when Naruto walked into the house. He then decided to take a quick look even though he knew it wasn't a good idea because he was interested. What he saw hurt his heart. While his family ate happily, Kashina and Minato listened patiently as Menma, Mito, and Natsumi talked about all the fun things they had done that day. Naruto felt bad when he saw how happy they were without him. There wasn't even a chair for him at the table, which wasn't something he expected, but it hurt to know that the family that was supposed to love and guide you through life had forgotten all about you. For this reason, Naruto went into his room with a heavy heart. His sadness turned into anger again, but he quickly got rid of it by remembering the wise words his sensei had taught him. Naruto asked himself in his mind, why do I still care? He was sure that his family would never love or care about him. Right then, Zarif's last words of the day came to mind, and he fully agreed with them. After all, what kind of family doesn't take care of one of its own members to the point where the person they trust the most is an emotionless mage from another world? I'm sick of this. If they don't want to be my family, I won't beg them to accept me. If they think they'll be happier without me, I won't stand in their way. I'm sick of waiting for them to treat me like a son or a brother. They're not my family anymore. They never were my family to begin with. Zarif is my only family. He cares about me more than anyone else has ever come close to being a father. Naruto, and he felt relieved for the first time in a long time. It was like a heavy weight had been lifted off his shoulders. With a clear head and a strong heart, the young blonde went to sleep thinking about the days that were to come. The rest of the Namikaze. Uzumaki family was still downstairs eating and talking happily, as if nothing was wrong. They had no idea that they had just pushed a family member so far that they might not be able to go back. After some years, they would finally understand what they had done, but it was too late for them. Naruto knew in his heart that the Namikaze. Uzumaki family was already broken and that no one could fix it. In a world where ninjas were common, it was necessary to be able to tell if someone was acting weird, unnatural, or just pretending to be someone else. 
If you wanted to live a long life in a place like the elemental nations, you had to know how to read people. Zaref himself thinks he is a master at reading people. After all, he was more than 400 years old, and people who live that long tend to learn skills like that. So it wasn't hard for that dark mage to notice how his student had changed. But Zaref had been watching Naruto since he was a baby, so he thought that any change in Naruto's behavior would always be noticed. Whenever Zaref gave Naruto a break from training, he would usually find him lying in his room or in the training area, staring blankly at the ceiling. This could have meant nothing to some, but Zaref could see the range of emotions his apprentice felt every time his mind wandered, hurt, betrayal, sadness, anger, and sometimes pure rage. This is why Zaref quickly came to the conclusion that every time that happened, it was a sign. Zaref made sure that his apprentice knew that it was okay to feel angry, but that one should never let hate rule their heart and actions, because that would only lead to a dark path that was best to never walk. He also made sure that Naruto knew that if he needed to talk to someone about anything, Zaref was more than happy to hear about his problems, which made Naruto feel a little better, that Zaref could still hear them. So it was clear that Zaref noticed Naruto's sudden change in behavior. Instead of the sad look he always had, Naruto was lying there with his eyes closed and a small smile on his face. This made Zaref wonder what had happened with his apprentice since they stopped training yesterday. It looks like you've found something good about Naruto. Kun. Would you mind telling me what it is? Zaref asked with a raised eyebrow, which caught the attention of the young blonde. Naruto. Kun just smiled at his emotionless sensei again and began to talk about the solution he had found yesterday. It was clear that Zaref was very proud of his apprentice after hearing Naruto's explanation. He had not let hate control him, even though he had every right to hate his family and wish them the worst. Naku asked Zaref, so, what do you think, sensei? He wanted to know what Zaref thought about what he decided yesterday. Naruto. Kun, I think you have been more mature than many people in this world. You haven't let hate and revenge fill your heart and mind, and for that I'm truly proud of you, Zaref said with a small, almost imperceptible smile. Naruto looked away from his sensei, feeling a little awkward after hearing such nice things from the only person whose opinion mattered to him. I thought I would be saying this in a month, but you have not only surprised me today, but you have also shown me that you were more than ready in mind and spirit for it. Tomorrow, Naruto. Kun, you're going to learn your first style of magic, Zaref said, his smile growing a little as he saw how happy his student looked when he heard the news. Along the same lines, Naruto was very excited about finally learning a type of magic. He was so happy that he couldn't stop jumping for joy, and he began muttering about all the kinds of magic he could learn. But his celebration was cut short when Zaref himself delivered a powerful kick to the head of the young blonde. She barely managed to avoid the kick by jumping backwards, which put more space between herself and Zaref. That doesn't mean that training for today is over, though, so don't go lowering your guard like that, Zaref said, his normally emotionless face showing. His student quickly nodded, still smiling, because he knew that tomorrow would be even better because he would finally be able to use magic properly. Even though Naruto had trained for a few hours, Zaref called off the day and told him to rest at home because he had to get some things ready for tomorrow and didn't want Naruto to hang out while he did them. Because of this, you could find the young blonde walking toward his house while the sun was high in the sky. He was thinking about what kind of magic he was going to learn tomorrow. Dark magic would have been the most obvious choice, but he knew he probably wasn't ready for something so dangerous, so he could only guess what Zaref had planned for him to learn. While walking, Naruto could feel some of the villagers glares at him. He didn't have to think long to figure out why they were staring at him. It's amazing how hate can truly blind someone. Just because I have whisker marks in my cheeks doesn't mean I'm some kind of demon, but I guess some people are just stupid like that, Naruto thought, annoyed that these people had chosen to focus their anger toward the Kyuubi on him. He knew he wasn't the Kyuubi reborn, and when he asked Zaref about his whisker marks, he said they were probably a result of being in his mother's womb while she was the Jinchuriki of the Kyuubi. He also said that anyone who blamed him for the Kyuubi's actions was a simple minded fool whose hate would poison his heart forever. Going back to Naruto, the young blonde had finally left the village's commercial district and entered the clan district. As the name suggests, this was where the clan's homes were located. The larger clans, the Hyuga and the Uchiha, both had their own districts. Naruto got to the Namikaze. Uzumaki clan's compound quickly. Despite its name, it was just a normal two. 
story house that wasn't too big or too small. Naruto walked into the front yard and noticed that the house's security seals didn't operate when he entered. This was likely because of his blood or something, but Naruto didn't know for sure because he didn't know enough about Fuenjut. He unlocked the door and looked around to see if anyone was home at this time. He thought that Minato must be working, so he was probably at the Hokage Tower. But he didn't know what the other family members were doing at this time, but he thought that they were probably training with Kashina in the backyard. The young blonde walked straight up to his room on the second floor as soon as he walked into the house. He didn't have anything to do, so he planned to meditate for a while, read some books he had, or maybe just sleep. Where did you go? What are you saying? Asked a cold, soft voice. This made Naruto stop in his tracks and turn around to look at the living room and the person who had just talked to him. The person was definitely a woman. Her long red hair reached her middle back and framed her face. She has a cute heart. Shaped face with violet eyes that were currently fixed on Naruto's blue eyes. The girl was wearing a simple white shirt with the symbol of Konoha on it. She was also wearing anbu pants that she usually wore for training and blue sandals. The girl was sitting on the couch with a scroll in her lap, probably some kind of. If Naruto was getting better at controlling his feelings, it wouldn't even come close to the level of control his sensei has. That's why the young blonde looked surprised when he saw who had asked where he was. He couldn't even remember the last time he talked to his sister, let alone when she started the conversation. His sister wasn't always mean to him. When they were seven, she stopped talking to him unless she had to and pretended he wasn't there. Before that, she was nice to him, she would play with him, and she even stood up for him when Menma insulted him. Naruto felt terrible when the one family member who used to treat him like a real family turned into a cold girl who didn't care about him. He always wondered why she had changed so much about how she felt about him. The young apprentice of Zeref had to take a moment to get the shock off of his face before telling the lie that his sensei had told him to tell anyone who asked where he was at the moment, which had never happened. Naruto tried hard to keep a straight face and a calm voice as he replied, I was at the library. His sister nodded in agreement and then went back to reading her scroll. Naruto thought the conversation was over, so the young blonde kept walking to his room. He didn't notice that his sister was watching him very closely until he was out of sight. He also missed the moment when her cold eyes turned to ones that showed how she really felt about her brother. Sad and regretful ones. The next day, Naruto was excited and Zerf was emotionless. He was holding a wooden box that looked like the one that held his magical container and standing in the middle of the magical circle that went across the floor of the training room. So, what am I going to learn, teacher? What's inside that wooden box? Naruto asked, looking at Zerif's hand with a mix of interest and fear. He remembered very well what happened the last time something was taken out of that box. Zerif opened the small box and took out what was inside, which was a crystal sphere about the size of his hand. The sphere was very strange because it was blue on the inside and had something yellow in the middle that looked like a spark. There was also a symbol on one side of the sphere that looked exactly like the one Naruto had on the back of his shirt, the head of a silver dragon. This is Naruto. Kun. Could you tell me what it is? Are you sure you remember what I taught you about the magical world? Zerif asked his apprentice. Naruto looked at the glass sphere for a while and thought about everything Zerif had told him about his world. It was clear that the sphere was magical. Naruto was amazed and remembered learning about these magical balls that people used for different reasons. It's a lacrima, he said. This is a unique lacrima, you could call it a dragon lacrima, Zerif confirmed, making his apprentice stare at the sphere in awe until he realized what his teacher had planned. Does this mean I'm going to learn Metsuriyu Maho, Dragon Slayer magic? Naruto was shocked. His sensei was going to teach him such a powerful lost magic? There are so many kinds of magic out there. Yes Naruto. Kun, I decided that before teaching you my own style of magic you need to learn something different and since the advantages of this type of magic can't be denied, I decided that it would be a good style for you to learn, replied Zerif in a straightforward way voice. As you already know, Naruto. Kun, when a dragon lacrima is put into the body of a mage, it makes them able to use dragon slayer magic as if they had been training with a real dragon. That's what we're going to do today. Fuse this lacrima with your body, making you a second. Generation Dragon Slayer, Zerif said, pausing to see if his apprentice had any questions. Naruto whispered, Wow, I'm going to be a Dragon Slayer. 
He looked at the crystal ball like it was a god, which it probably was to him. If I may ask, what kind of element does that lacrima hold? Asked the young blonde, who was very interested in everything to do with the sphere that would let him use such strong magic. This lacrima has the lightning element, Naruto. Kun. That means you will be learning Kaminari no Metsuri Umaho, lightning dragon slayer magic, Zarif said, but he had one more thing to say before fusing the sphere with his apprentice. As we prepare to fuse the two, Naruto. Kun, there is one more thing you should know, this lacrima holds more than just dragon magic. It holds a soul as well. The soul of a dragon, Zarif told his apprentice, shocking him to the core. What? But Zarif. Sensei, how is that even possible? No way that could be possible, Naruto thought. Even if you could find a way to seal a dragon's soul in a lacrima, there would still be the matter of founding the soul itself. After all, there weren't any dragons in the elemental nations, right? You need to understand something, Naruto. Kun. Dragons are the strongest living things in the world. It's not hard to go from one world to another when you have that much power. At least, it wasn't when there were a lot of them. There were five different dragons that came to this world a long time ago during the Civil Dragon War in my world. Each dragon had the power of a different element. That was done to make sure that their race wouldn't go extinct if the Civil War went badly. One of them, Rajin the Lightning Dragon King of this world, I found on my travels. He said no when I asked if he could lend me some of his magic, which was disappointing. I knew that a real dragon would never say no to a duel, so I challenged him to one. If I won, he would give me some of his power, but if I lost, he would kill me. I was able to beat him, even though it wasn't easy. As he was dying, he told me that he wanted to know who would use his magic, so I fused his soul with the lacrima that holds his powers. Hello Naruto. Kun, do you get it now? Said Zarif, thinking back to his meeting with Rajin, the powerful dragon. It was Rajin who gave Zarif the information about the other four dragons, but he hasn't been able to find any of them yet. Naruto was thinking about what his sensei had just said, feeling both shocked and amazed. Shocked that there really are dragons in the elemental nations, and amazed that his sensei had been able to defeat one. If what he knows about dragons is true, which it should be since Zarif told him about them, then his sensei is one of the strongest people in the elemental nations right now. Sensei, will the soul inside the lacrima change the process? What exactly is going to happen when the orb of crystal and I fuse? Naruto asked after giving what his sensei had just said some thought. Of course, hearing that made Naruto a little nervous because he would be meeting Reijin. Yes and no Naruto. Kun, Zarif replied. I can assure you that the process itself won't be dangerous to you, even with the soul in the lacrima. But I can also tell you that you will probably have to meet with Reijin himself. After all, that's why I put his soul in the lacrima in the first place. She told Zarif, all right, and don't worry, this won't hurt as much as the last time we did something similar. This was just before the magic circle came back to life. Naruto did nothing but lay there on his back and watch as his sensei put the sphere of power close to his chest and another hand on his forehead. That was the last thing the blonde saw before he passed out. His last thought was that this time there was no pain. Naruto woke up with a terrible headache because the rocks on the floor were being too much for him. What? Rocks? After having that thought, Naruto jumped out of his chair and looked around. It didn't take him long to realize that he wasn't in the training room he had been in just seconds before. It seemed like a terrible wasteland there. The ground was full of small rocks and there were a few dead trees here and there. If you looked up, you could see the white moon in a sky that was completely black, with not a single star visible. The young man who was about to become a dragon slayer didn't know what to do, so he decided to just walk around and see if he could find any clues. The last thing he remembered was being in the training room while Zarif fused the dragon lacrima with his body. Naruto was more annoyed than anything else after a few minutes of walking. He thought he had seen the same tree five times already, which was making him a little mad. By the sixth time, the young blonde was ready to punch the stupid street to see if all his hard work had paid off. Even though Naruto wanted to get revenge on the poor dead tree, he was stopped by the sound of wings flapping. When the young blonde turned around, he saw something big, so big that his shadow covered Naruto completely. The strange being then landed a few meters away from the blonde, stirring up some dust that was easily swept away by another flapping of its wings. 
Now that Naruto had a good look at the being, he was more than amazed by how beautiful it was. That thing was now standing tall and proud in front of Naruto, its four paws holding its huge body together easily. There was no way Naruto could have known that this being was so big. It was at least as tall as the Kyubi, if not taller. Insect. Like, its body was a grayish blue color, and its mouth was slightly open to show a set of very sharp teeth that would destroy anything they touched. It had yellow eyes and a set of yellow spines on top of its head that went all the way down to the end of its neck. After that, there was a big patch of white hair that covered most of its upper body. He had strong black claws on each of its four paws that looked just as dangerous as the fangs in its mouth. On its back, you could see its two large wings spread out fully, and at the end of its body was a big tail with some white hair that ended in a yellow point that looked like a trident. The blonde young woman couldn't even move because of this thing. Naruto could feel how powerful it was, and he was scared more than ever before. The monster's head sunk until it was level with Naruto's. The young blonde could feel its eyes looking at him, as if to see if he was worth something, which he hoped he was. Everything had been quiet for a while, so the young blonde was very surprised when this man spoke first, his strong voice resonating through the room. So you are the human who will use my power, the powerful creature said. Naruto's face went from being amazed and scared to confused as his mind kicked in and reminded him of who he was supposed to meet. It wasn't hard to figure out who the creature was just by looking at it. Naruto tried hard to hide his fear in his voice and face as he said, You are Raijin, the Dragon King of Lightning. Correct little human, my name is Raijin and that is my title. Although I guess I should say it was my title since I'm already dead after all, verify the strong dragon. Do you hate my sensei for killing you? He felt bad that he let his curiosity get the best of him and asked Naruto out of the blue. After all, he didn't want to bother someone that could eat him. Raijin said, if you mean Zarif, then no, I don't hate him. I accepted his challenge after all. My dead it's my own fault for losing to a human, not the human that beat me. Although I'm both surprised and happy to see that he accepted my dying request. Naruto let out a breath he didn't know he was holding, relieved that this dragon didn't hold a grudge against his sensei. He told me that your last wish was to meet the person who can use your magic. This time Naruto was a little more calm. The dragon said, yes, I did want to know who would keep using my powers after I die. He then tilted his head to the side and asked, what is your name, little human? Hi, my name is Naruto. Nice to meet you, Reijin. San, the young blonde said with a friendly smile. Reijin responded with a more sly smile, or at least that's what the young blonde thought it was. Reijin joked, Naruto, eh? Hum, so my power is going to be passed on to a little fish cake? What a waste. This made Naruto laugh and his eyes twitch a little. Naruto said, it means maelstrom, not fish cake. He was annoyed by the Dragon King more than scared of him. Reijin said, whatever you say, little fish cake. Naruto growled at him, but that only made the great dragon laugh loudly, which caught Naruto off guard. You should loosen up a bit, little human. You're too stiff for my taste, but I guess you'll do fine. I can't pick up on any strong negative emotions from you, and if Zarif is training you himself, then. Yes, I'm sure you'll do more than well with my powers, Reijin said in a more serious tone at the end, getting Naruto's happy face quickly changing into one of surprise. Wait, you can sense my emotions? Naruto was shocked because he had no idea dragons could do that. Of course I can human, that is an old art we dragon know, but even that cannot tell me everything so I want to know, what will you do once you have learned everything about my powers? In order to find out if the young blonde would tell the truth, Reijin looked into Naruto's blue eyes with yellow eyes. Reijin already knew about Naruto's life and plans. He has known since the dragon Lacrima fused with the young blonde, but he wanted to hear it from the person who was telling it. At the same time, Naruto gave this question a lot of thought. What did he want to do? To get stronger? But why? What would he do if he had power? He knew he didn't want to show it to his family because he didn't care what they thought of him anymore. Was it to keep the village safe? That wasn't it. He doesn't owe the village of Konoha anything, so what's the point? He remembered what Zarif had told him yesterday about how bonds are what make you strong and why you should always protect them. The answer hit him like a ton of bricks. Before Zarif came along, Naruto had only felt lonely since he was a child. 
He wanted to never feel that way again, so he would protect the bonds between people he cared about, even if it meant risking his own life. Right now, Zarif was the only person in that group, but Naruto hoped he could make more, so he would never have to feel truly alone again. Naruto spoke with passion and determination in his eyes and voice, I. I want to protect those that I really care about, those that make me stronger, those that I can call friends. Those that I can call family. I see. That's a good answer, little human. Just remember that, because power can change even the purest souls, Reijin said as he flapped his wings, lifting Naruto off the ground and creating a lot of wind. The young blonde thought she was going to hit the rocky floor, but when she did, she fell into nothingness. The floor and everything on it had been gone for a long time. Good luck, little human, you're going to need it, was the last scary thing Naruto heard the great dragon say. After that, everything turned black. After that, Naruto would be passed out and Zarif would be meditating in the real world, where we left them. The dark mage was waiting for his apprentice to finish his chat with Reijin about souls. He knew that both the human and the dragon needed that conversation. Since he found Reijin by accident, Zarif had spent a lot of his life here in the elemental nation looking for the other four dragons. He had always been curious about where they were. In reality, he had heard that Oni no Kuni, Demon Country, was home to a powerful monster, so he went there to find out for himself. He ended up in a huge cave where he found the dragon. He didn't want to miss the chance, so he asked the strong animal to give him some of its power. That way, when he met Naruto, he would have a strong magic to teach him. The dragon turned down Zarif's request, saying he wouldn't mess with humans or give them power. So Zarif had to use plan B and challenge the old lizard to a duel. He had to admit that Reijin was tough, but not as strong as someone like Acknologia, so Zarif beat him. He then sealed some of Reijin's power in the Lacrima and put the dragon's soul inside it as well, hoping to at least grant the dragon's dying wish of finding out who was going to use his magic. Zarif then went to find the other four dragons in the hopes that they would give him their powers without having to fight them. He tried to find all of them but couldn't, so he decided to do the best he could with what he had. Which, if you asked him, was a lot. He had to say that Kaminari no Metsuri Umaho, Lightning Dragon Slayer magic, was a pretty powerful lost magic and that being immune to one of the elements was a damn good advantage in a world where a lot of its techniques were based on them. Someone moaned, ah, uh, my head. Which caught Zarif's attention. Of course, the person who just groaned was Naruto, who had just gotten up from having a thought conversation with Reijin. Zarif softly asked Naruto, how do you feel, Naruto? Kun? He planned to ask later for more information about Naruto's conversation with Reijin. Natsu didn't answer, though. He just smiled and looked at his teacher before raising his right arm and making a fist. Drawing on his magic, Naruto gave it shape in his mind, like a lightning bolt, which came naturally to him. Just as Zarif looked, Naruto's arm began to give off static until it was completely covered in electricity. I think I'm good, Sensei. On that day, a dragon. Slayer was born. Konohagakir no Sado, 12 years after the attack by the Kayubi. The Ninja School. Young children came here, and after three years, they could finally become ninjas in the village. The strongest team, the Densetsu no Sanin, Great Three Ninjas, was formed here, and right now a special group of students were starting their first month of school. What's so great about this group? The answer was easy. It was the fact that most of the young ninjas who were being trained were the children or grandchildren of Konoha's many clans. As soon as they turned 13, these young people would be ninjas. They were the village's future, and the ninja academy was where they would take their first steps toward becoming proud shinobi and kunoichi of the leaf. One of these kids was a blonde boy with blue eyes and two sets of whiskers on his cheeks. His seat was in the very back of the class, right next to a window. He was thinking about how he could be training instead of learning about the history of the village. And that boy was none other than our hero, Uzumaki. Namikaze Naruto. And right now, that hero was, well, bored. He knew that Ninja Academy didn't have very high standards, but after only three weeks of class, he was sure that the next three years wouldn't be any better. That's because all they did in class was talk about the Shodem and how great he was. We get it. He was a good shinobi. You don't have to tell us that again. Again and again, the young Dragon Slayer thought as he let out a frustrated sigh. He didn't like that these lectures meant he had to cut his normal training with Zarif in half. Naruto was worried that his parents would forget to register him before the academy even started. 
It wasn't until his sensei told him that he had been registered since birth because of village law that he calmed down. The young blonde had, of course, talked to his sensei about how to change his training schedule to fit with the academies. Zarif had just told them that he would be going to the academy every day and then coming back to the training room to train for the rest of the day. This meant that he would only have half as much time to train every day, which made Naruto very angry, but there was nothing he could do. Thinking about the time he didn't get to train made Naruto remember how Zarif changed the way he usually trained. It wasn't that big. Some days were just magical training with his Kaminari no Metsuri Umaho, Lightning Dragon Slayer magic. Zarif made him use that magic in their spars, but he still couldn't beat his sensei, and Zarif hadn't even used magic in spars before. His sensei told him that since he was a 2 do generation dragon slayer and didn't have a dragon to train with, he would have to make up his own spells. This made the young blonde nervous at first, but he soon realized it wasn't that hard. He could picture the different techniques in his mind, he just had to learn how to use them in real life. According to Zarif, this was probably a side effect of having Raijin's soul inside him. He also told him that he could probably learn more spells in his mind if he worked harder, but it was up to him to practice and get good at them. That, along with Zarif's personal advice, since he had seen a lot of dragons and dragon slayers, meant that Naruto was making great progress in his magic. The young Zarif apprentice was thinking when he heard a sigh to his right. This made the young blonde turn to his right to see who it was, he thought it was probably the same person who was bored as him. He had to admit that he wasn't surprised to see who it was, she always sat next to him in the same spot. The girl's black hair was pulled back into a ponytail that just touched the beginning of her back. She also had two bangs that framed her face. Her eyes were black and her skin was pale. She was dressed in a simple blue shirt with the symbol of her clan on the back of it. She also had on white shorts and blue sandals. Yes, that girl was Uchiha Sasaki. She was the daughter of the head of the Uchiha clan and the little sister of the genius Uchiha Itachi. Like our young hero, she was really bored. Naruto and the young Uchiha both knew that the academy's standards had dropped after the third ninja war because her brother had told her. But the young Uchiha thought this was getting silly. This might be a little more interesting if he talked about Uchiha Madara, the young Uchiha thought. All the instructor has talked about is Hashirama Senju and his Mokaton wood release. He was sick and tired of hearing about the Shodam all the time. It wasn't a surprise that she liked Uchiha Madara more than Senju Hashirama. He had been her hero for as long as she could remember. Even though he was a traitor to the village, he was still seen as the strongest Uchiha, and Uchiha Sasaki wanted power more than anything else. Now if only she could have gotten that strong without being kicked out of the village and having to fight the Hokage, which Madara was famous for. The little black girl with black hair felt like someone was watching her from the left. When she turned around, all she saw was the blonde girl who always sat there reading a scroll and didn't pay any attention to the Chunin teacher's lesson. Sasaki had to admit that she had never talked to the first son of the Namikaze. Uzumaki clan. The reason was pretty simple, she wasn't good at making friends. In fact, the only other kid in her class she talked to was Mito, and that was because her mother Makoto and Mito's mother were close friends. She always sat here because there were no other seats available on the first day of class, so she had to take the last one, which was the one next to young Naruto. After that day, she stayed there even though there were other available seats because, unlike most of the other students, Naruto was pretty quiet and didn't talk to her in any way, which Sasaki liked because she could escape. The young Uchiha looked at the young blonde with a raised eyebrow. She was a little interested in what he was reading, but not enough to ask, so she just went back to paying attention to the class, even though she thought this was a waste of time. At the same time, Zarif's young apprentice had already forgotten all about the lesson and was reading a scroll about fuenjutsu, sealing techniques, which Naruto thought was very interesting. He thought it might have something to do with his Uzumaki blood, since that clan was known for making amazing seals. Also, the art was perfect for someone like him, whose training made it easy for him to focus on something so complicated. For these boys and girls at the academy, their lives were just beginning, which made more than one student mad. Many of the students who are leaving the academy now that class is overthought, thank Kami. One of them was Naruto, who was glad that the boring torture they call lessons was over and that he could finally train with his sensei. That young blonde man began to walk toward the magical circle. This time, though, he wasn't going to the Hokage Monument. After walking for a while, Naruto reached one of the village's residential areas. 
After walking for a few more minutes, he reached an empty alley. He used Henge no Jutsu, transformation technique, to make himself look like a normal middle. Aged man with brown hair, brown eyes, and a small goatee. He then made sure that no one was watching him. Naruto then left the alley and went to a small apartment that was part of a building with more apartments. When he pulled out the keys and opened the door, he saw a simple apartment with just a kitchen, a table, a door to the bathroom, and a bedroom with a bed at the far end. The young blonde let go of the jutsu and went straight to the end of the bedroom, where he pressed his hand against the wooden wall. Almost right away, a magical circle appeared, which made Naruto smile a little. This apartment was one of the gifts Zerif gave him a few weeks before he started school. One reason Zerif gave Naruto this little apartment was so that he could be closer to the academy, which would help him. The other reason was that Zerif wanted to get Naruto out of his family's house because staying there could lead to problems in the future. The dark mage had to admit that he was worried that someone would notice that the young blonde wasn't living with his family. But it had been over a month and nothing had happened, so Zerif had to agree with Naruto that no one was waiting for him at that house. He also got Zerif's own necklace, which was a very simple gift but something he wore all the time. The dark mage had just told him that it was a good luck charm, but Naruto saw it as more than that. When he was a kid, he never got a birthday present, so this necklace had a lot of meaning for him. Naruto could still remember how he started to cry just before giving Zerif a big hug. The Dark Lord responded with an awkward pat on the back, which showed Naruto how strange the situation was for him. No, that day was when Naruto knew Zerif was really like a father to him. In the present, the young dragon slayer sent some of his magic into the magical circle, making it shine with purple light. Just then, the young blonde vanished in a black flash, and the young dragon slayer always had a smile on his face. Even though he had trained with his sensei, his favorite part of the day was spending time with his dad. After a month, Konohagakure no Sado. The girl Sasaki Uchiha was very upset. You might ask why? Because her oni. Sama had told her he would help her train with kanai, shuriken, and kaiden jutsu, fire style techniques, but he got a mission at the last minute and couldn't. This made her very angry. Do not get the wrong idea. Sasaki knew that her brother had a lot to do as an Anbu member, but this was the third time he had cancelled their training, so it was only natural for her to be angry. Because of this, the young Uchiha could be seen walking with a frown toward a training ground where she could work out by herself on Sundays. There were many training grounds for her clan that she could have gone to, but today she just wanted to burn something a little and she thought it would be best to do it alone so no one would see her lose her temper. That's why she went to a training ground that she knew was empty most of the time because no one used it. And the young girl with black hair was really shocked when she found someone here doing what looked like taijutsu training. At first glance, Sasaki knew right away who was in the training ground. That person's hair color and black clothes could only belong to one person, in her opinion. When did Namikaze start training here? Thought Sasaki, who was very interested in Naruto's training. Her first thought was to just leave and find another place to train, but then she had an idea. Not only could she learn more about someone in her class, but she could also practice staying quiet and gathering information, which her oni. Sama had told her was important for Anbu. With these goals in mind, the young Uchiha hid herself in a tree inside the training ground, far enough away that she didn't think the blonde Namikaze would notice her, and she just watched the boy. She watched as the blonde did moves from a style of fighting she had never seen before. Just then, she started practicing throwing kanai and shuriken at the tree bark. The young Uchiha was impressed by how good the blonde was with those weapons. She didn't think he was as good as her oni. Sama, but she did think he was better than most of the other students at the academy. Something about that made Sasaki frown. She remembered that Namikaze didn't do very well on the tests at the academy with kanai and shuriken. So how was it that he was so good at it now, when in his last shuriken lesson a week ago he could only hit half of the targets on the training dummy? Sasuke became more and more interested in the blonde boy as time went on. Naruto went to the middle of the training ground and started meditating after practicing with normal ninja tools for a few minutes. This confused Sasuke a lot because she knew how to meditate, but she didn't know that someone her age already knew how to do it. She was about to leave for her house to think about who Uzumaki. Namikaze Naruto was and maybe even ask Mito about it since she was his sister when she heard a calm, monotonous voice stop her in her tracks. Spying is rude, you know? He said this, which made young Uchiha turn around and see that Zerif's young apprentice was still in the middle of the training ground, 
but his eyes were open and were looking right at where she was hiding. This made Sasaki's eyes wide with surprise. She thought she had hidden herself perfectly, so how did Namikaze find her? At that point, the young Uchiha girl could either run away and act like nothing happened, or she could talk to the blonde Uzumaki. Namikaze boy and try to find out what was going on. She made up her mind in less than a second. Naruto looked straight at Sasaki from the moment she climbed down the tree until she was right in front of him. Her arms were crossed over her chest, and she still had a scowl on her face. What do you want, Uchiha? Naruto asked in the same voice as before, standing up and looking straight at Sasaki with a bored look that made Sasaki a little mad. Sasaki asked, what were you doing? Not answering Naruto's question at all, which made Naruto raise an eyebrow in interest before answering. Training. And since when were you so good at throwing things? Sasaki asked roughly, eager to find out the truth quickly. Naruto told Uchiha, that's none of your business. You should just leave already. He was mad at Sasaki, but he didn't show it. The young Uchiha was getting antsy. She wanted to know how strong this guy really was since the skills he showed in the academy were obviously fake. After all, no one gets that good in just a week, so she came to the conclusion that he was hiding his real skills for some reason, but why? She was going to find out, though, and after a moment of thought, she came up with a way to test her theory. Naruto was given a mean look as Sasaki said, fight me. The blonde only raised an eyebrow at this. Excuse me? She said, you heard me, fight me, and her voice got stronger. Her plan was pretty simple. She was going to fight him and see how strong he was to see if he was really holding back at the academy. After all, the students had already been spared once, and if she remembered correctly, Naruto hadn't done a great job when they fought Kiba in Azuka. Though Naruto was about to say no, a thought stopped the blonde in his tracks. Sasuke was waiting for an answer. Naruto thought, this might be a good chance to see just how strong I am. He wanted to test himself against someone other than Zarif, since sparring with him always ends with Zarif being calm and Naruto being beaten. He couldn't show off how strong he really was at the academy because his sensei told him not to draw attention to himself or act too good or too bad. This meant that he had to control his skills and act like any other student, not too good or too bad. When Naruto asked Zarif why he had to do this, he told him that control is a tool that must always be used and that deception is a ninja's most powerful weapon. Naruto had no choice but to accept this and control himself at the academy, which gave him a chance to finally put himself to the test. Okay, said the young blonde, who made the Uchiha look surprised. Her face then turned into a small smirk, and she looked sure of herself. After all, she could ask Naruto any questions she wanted after she beat him. Naruto confirmed, no jutsu or weapons, just taijutsu, understood? Sasaki nodded in agreement. She was now standing a little farther away from Naruto and had already started her clan's fighting style, which, if Naruto remembered correctly, was called the Interceptor Fist and was based on anticipating and countering your opponent's movements with the Sharingan, copy. Wheel Eye. If Naruto was right, Sasaki had not awakened her Sharingan, though. This meant that her fighting style would be missing some parts. Then that's it, Hajime. Naruto said right before starting his own style of Taijutsu, which was based on speed and accuracy. This style was one that Zarif showed him. It was used to avoid attacks and hit your enemy just at the right time. When combined with Naruto's natural speed, which could go faster with magic, it made them an amazing force. The young blonde girl decided to really mess with Sasaki to get back at her for spying on him, even though he knew she was here the whole time. He knew Sasaki wouldn't attack first because that's not how the Uchiha fought, so he just stood there. After staring at Naruto for a few minutes, which made Sasaki very angry based on her glare, the young Uchiha decided to attack herself. The stupid blonde wasn't going to move, so she ran at him at what Naruto thought was probably Genin. Like speed, which surprised him since they were just starting the academy. Even so, Naruto thought she was moving really slowly, so when Sasaki finally caught up to her, she aimed a right fist at him. This made Sasaki growl and try her luck with another punch. This time, Naruto grabbed Sasaki's wrist so hard that the Uchiha girl couldn't get free, so she went for another fist, but the young apprentice of Zarif grabbed her other wrist too. Before she could do anything, Sasaki pushed him away, and he jumped backwards to make more space between them. It went on like this for a little more than 10 minutes. Every time Satsuki tried to hit Naruto, the young blonde would either dodge or block, never attacking, even though he had several chances to do so. 
This made Satsuki more and more angry. The young blonde decided to end it after 15 minutes of sparing, so when Sasaki threw her another punch, he grabbed her wrist and quickly twisted her arm behind her back so she couldn't see. He then pushed Sasaki down, making her fall face first to the ground. Naruto asked, do you yield? He then twisted Sasaki's arm a little more to show her that the fight was over. Naruto could only barely make out what Sasaki said under her breath. Was was that? I said that a yield, now get off me you baka. Sasaki yelled, furious that someone her age had played so well against her. Someone agreed, let go of Sasaki, and then stood up to offer the young girl a hand to help her. The girl slapped him away, then stormed off the training ground with a heavy scowl on her face. If Naruto heard her correctly, her last words before she left sounded like, this is not over. But Naruto always had a confused look on his face, and in a single comment, he let out his confusion. Was it something I said? Uzumaki. Namikaze Naruto wasn't great at working with other people. He said that was because of his sensei. When Konohagakure no Sato is two years old. Naruto has been in school for two years now, and every Sunday he was in the same place, which was, of course, on top of a certain Uchiha princess. Not like that. Sasaki Uchiha has made it a point to challenge Naruto to a fight every Sunday at the same training ground ever since their little fight two years ago. Naruto thought about moving, but he couldn't think of a reason to do so because he thought the spars were a good workout and Zarif had even said it was a good chance for Naruto to train with someone other than him, so the young blonde had agreed to spar every time Sasaki challenged him. She still hadn't won one, though. It wasn't a surprise to find Naruto, who is now 15 years old, on top of Sasaki's back, with her arm again twisted in her back and a cute, angry look on her face. The voice of Naruto was a little funny as he asked, do you yield? This was his favorite way to end a fight. Also, Sasuke hated it more that way. Yes, Yubaka. Now get off of me before I burn you, Sasuke threatened half. Heartedly, letting out a sigh of irritation. The young blonde girl happily agreed right away, and just like the first time they spared, he offered to help her get up. This time, she actually took his hand and smiled a little. Nineteen months had passed since they last saw each other. In Zarif's case, for example, the apprentice had completely changed his outfit. He now wears a black shirt without sleeves under a black jacket with white lining around the edges. The jacket has long sleeves and is buttoned at the top, so you can see his black shirt. On the back of that jacket, there was the same symbol as on his old clothes, a silver dragon's head. He wore black anbu pants and a pair of black ninja sandals. His kanai was held in his right leg. He also wears black gloves without fingers and wears the necklace Zarif gave him over his jacket and around his neck with pride. Not only did his clothes change, but so did his golden blonde hair, which was now tamed and reached his shoulders. Also, a year ago, his whisker marks began to fade. He began training in Yami no Maho, Darkness Magic, the same day. It was a year ago when Zarif's training place. After getting a nod from the Dark Mage, Naruto asked his father figure, seriously? He was both excited and nervous. Zarif confirmed, yes Naruto. Kun, today we'll start your training in Yami no Maho, Darkness Magic. Naruto was excited to finally learn the magic that his sensei uses, but he quickly put on a serious face when he saw that Zarif was even more serious than usual, which meant that whatever he was going to say was very important. First, I'm going to explain exactly what you're going to learn, Naruto. Kun. What I'm going to teach you is Yami no Maho, darkness magic, in its purest form. That is, Naruto. Kun, you're going to learn how to use the darkness in your heart to its fullest, Zarif said. He then put his hand on Naruto's mouth to stop him from speaking, knowing the blonde would probably say something. You have to understand Naruto. Kun that every single human being has darkness in his or her heart, no matter who they are or what life they had. What I'm going to teach Naruto. Kun is how to use your magic to give form to that darkness, to use it as you see fit without letting it to control you Naruto. Kun. You could say that there are three kind of people in this world Naruto. Kun. Those that deny their own darkness, those that let their own darkness to control them, and those that control said darkness, those that accept they have it but they don't let it control them, for you to learn this form of magic Naruto. Kun you must become that type of person or you won't learn anything. Yami no Maho, darkness magic, is one of the magic that depends more heavily in your feelings Naruto. Kun, 
That's why I have been teaching you how to control them, since with this kind of magic everything is about intent. You must not only give form to your darkness with magic Naruto. Kun, you must also give it a purpose in your mind or else it won't work, which means that is a style with endless possibilities, it just depends on how you use it, Zarif said, seeing how his words made Naruto look at the ground with a thoughtful look in his eyes. Do you think you're ready to learn from Naruto? Kun? Zarif asks, his black eyes fixed on his student. Zarif knew that teaching Yami no Maho, darkness magic, to someone Naruto's age could be very risky because it would be like opening a real Pandora's box. But he had faith in his apprentice's inner strength and knew that Naruto was ready for it, so he wasn't surprised when Naruto looked at him with determination in his eyes and gave him a simple but firm nod. After that, the training started up again. It had to be the hardest thing Naruto had ever done to learn how to use Yami no Maho, darkness magic. Even though Zarif was his sensei, he still had trouble with even the simplest spells because they were always too unstable or he would get too tired after doing just one. It had been a year. He asked his sensei what he was doing wrong, but all he said was that it was because he wasn't practicing enough. Naruto thought that his sensei was trying to hide something from him. But his training with his Kaminari no Metsuri Umaho, Lightning Dragon Slayer magic, was going really well. He had a lot more control over it now, and he could cast a lot of spells without getting tired. Zarif told him that this was partly because his magical contained and Tenketsu point had grown from the training, but he still hadn't learned any of the Metsuriyu Ogi, Dragon Slayer's secret art. As Sasaki waved her hand in front of Naruto's face, the young blonde girl's attention was taken away from his training and turned to his Uchiha friend. Naruto had to admit that Sasaki was looking really pretty. Since last year, she had let her dark, raven hair hang loose. It now reached her middle back, and two bangs framed her very pretty face. She changed her clothes just like he did. She now wears blue wrist warmers and a gray short. Sleeved shirt with a zipper in the front that shows off her growing bee. Cup breasts. It looked like she had on the same ambu pants as him and blue shinobi sandals. You were blanking out there, Sasaki told his sparring partner in a matter. Of. Fact voice. He raised an eyebrow and looked at his partner. Just thinking about some stuff, you don't have to worry. I wasn't. If you say so, Naruto replied. He then sat down on the ground and began meditating, which he found very relaxing after sparring. Sasuke, meanwhile, did nothing but stare at Naruto before letting out a sigh and walking over to a tree to rest in its shade. Two people who were about to become ninjas just stood there in silence. But everything has to end sometime. She looked at her blonde friend again and said, we are graduating soon. Yes, friend, she never thought she'd call him that, but after sparring with him every Sunday for two years and talking to him afterward, she realized he wasn't such a bad guy after all. It annoyed her that he was always so calm, just like her Oni. Sama, but she liked being with him even more after that. What really happened was simple. A year ago, during their normal training routine, which meant Naruto easily beating her, she badly twisted her ankle so that she couldn't move without a lot of pain. So, Naruto, being the gentleman that he was, decided to carry her to her house like a princess, which made the Uchiha beauty blush the whole time, but she couldn't do anything about it, so after a few minutes, Naruto let her go. But he didn't. He said that someone who was hurt shouldn't be left alone like this, so he decided to stay and take care of her. This made the young Uchiha blush and protest again, but Naruto wouldn't have it. After treating her injury as best he could, he cooked her lunch and dinner and stayed in the house until it was really late to make sure she didn't do anything stupid while she was hurt. At the end of the day, all she did was ask him why he was doing all this for her. His answer made her stop thinking for a minute. That's what friends are for, aren't they? From that day on, Sasaki had to wait for Sunday to spar before she could talk to him. She still saw him and sat next to him, but they didn't talk much at the academy, even though they ate lunch together every day. What's more, Naruto ate alone on the roof, and when Sasuke found him, she stayed there and ate with him in peace. Naruto, who was still meditating, said, yeah. Just a few more months of torture and we're all set to go. This answer gave Sasuke a small smile just before it turned into a frown. Sasuke asked out of the blue, do you think we'll be put on the same team? Naruto could tell she was trying to hide her hope, but he could hear it in her voice anyway. He wouldn't be surprised. He too would like to be on the same team with her, along with Narashikamaru and himself. Do you want to know why Shikamaru? 
it's been a few months since our blonde hero played shogi with Shikamaru during lunch. The lazy Nara clan member then chose to use the roof as a place to watch the clouds. Shikamaru won that game, and he and Akamichi Choji would play during lunch, where Akamichi Choji sometimes stayed as well. The young blonde was impressed by Shikamaru's strategic skills and would love to be on the same team as him. If you added someone he knew, like Sasaki, he would be in a team he could easily work with. Naruto replied, I don't know. Anything could happen, though I do hope that happens tough. Sasaki smiled and nodded, glad that her friend wanted to be on the same team as her. If that does happen, just don't drag me down, Naruto, Sasuke joked with a smirk. This made Naruto open his eyes and look at her with a bored expression. That's interesting, you took the words right out of my mouth, Naruto replied. He then had to move his face to avoid getting hit by a kanai that Sasuke had just decided to throw at him, with a tick mark on her forehead. Yes, it was a really good friendship. It was another Sunday, and Naruto had to go to the now famous training room because Zeref had something to tell him. That's why you could see him walking down the hallway that led from the rooms in this building to the training room. Even though he said goodbye quickly, Sasuke had questions, and Naruto had to lie to her because he couldn't say where they were going. Sasuke has asked Naruto many times how he became so strong since she knew that Mito said he didn't train with his family. Naruto had just told her that he had a great sensei and would always try to change the subject, so Sasuke stopped asking about it after a while. But she still wanted to know, so she told him that he had to tell her anything if she beat him in a fight, which he agreed to do just to stop her asking. When the young dragon slayer finally got to the training room, he saw his sensei meditating in the middle of it, as usual. He stayed there and waited for his sensei to explain why he had called him on a Sunday, since that always meant something important. After a while, Zeref stopped meditating and stood up. He looked at Naruto with his usual emotionless gaze before speaking. Zeref told his student, Today Naruto. Kun you will do the last part of your training in Yami no Maho, Darkness Magic. The student raised an eyebrow. Naruto asked with a lot of interest in his voice, What do you mean by that sensei? And what is this last step? Naruto. Kun, there is something you need to do before you can really use Yami no Maho, Darkness Magic, properly. Before you ask, the reason I didn't tell you about it at the beginning was because you weren't ready for it. I told you about it before because I wanted you to understand how Yami no Maho, darkness magic, worked. That's why you can't use it properly, but today we will fix that, Zeref, Maki. What do I have to do? You are going to face your own darkness Naruto. Kun, that's the only way for you to be able to use Yami no Maho, darkness magic. Naruto asked, what do you mean by that? He didn't understand what, facing your darkness, meant. Once we start, you'll understand. But this is a test you have to do on your own, and I can't promise your safety, Naruto. Kun, so I have to ask, are you sure you're ready to take this step? Once it starts, there's no going back, Zeref asked Naruto. Zeref looked into Naruto's blue eyes, hoping to find any doubt, but he didn't see any. When Naruto said he was ready, Zeref had no objections, and the test began. A magical circle in the ground turned on again, just like the other times. But this time, something strange happened, Zeref made something show up on his hand. The young blonde barely had time to change the shape of the sword into a katana before it plunged right into his chest. He was surprised that he didn't feel any pain, but he could tell that he was weakening by the second. Zeref's black eyes were the last thing Naruto saw before he muttered something that Naruto just barely heard. Good luck. Another man was walking through the streets of the village's clan district, heading toward a certain house with a big job that he thought could have a big impact on Konoha. Naruto was getting ready for his toughest test yet. Having that thought made the man laugh a little. He had lost some of his love for this village over the years, and he was sure that if it wasn't for meeting that. He probably would have turned against the village if he was a monster, but now he was doing things that were good for the village. Yes, it is very ironic. Even just thinking about that meeting made him so scared that it made his already pale face even paler. He had never been so scared in his whole life, not even the third ninja war made him feel that much pain. He really didn't want to meet that being again because that proved how bad it was. That's too bad fate likes to mess with people so much. When this man with black hair finally found the house he was looking for, he lost his train of thought. He knew that the man and woman he wanted to talk to were already in the house, probably just finishing dinner or something. 
since it was late at night, he just decided to ring the doorbell and see who answered. The door was opened by a man with spiked blonde hair and blue eyes, which didn't surprise him at all. Behind him stood a woman with long red hair and violet eyes. Perfect, thought the man with black hair. After all, his goal was to involve the Hokage and his wife in something important, and he couldn't leave until the job was done. What are you doing here? Which was, of course, about a certain blonde mage. Orochimaru? In the meantime, in a place no one knew. She was shocked, confused, and at a loss for words. Any of those words could be used to describe how Naruto felt at this very moment. It was a very simple reason. It wasn't that he was in a strange stadium in Kami knows where. It was the person standing in front of him with a twisted grin on their face. Why did this person make Naruto feel this way? That was because this guy was so much like Naruto that it was impossible to tell them apart. The only thing that made him different from Naruto was that his clothes were the exact opposite color and his eyes were bright yellow instead of blue. One more thing about this guy was that Naruto could feel only bad intentions coming from him. The man who looked like Naruto asked, so the little weakling finally decided to show up, huh? This made the blonde look at him with a mean face. Who are you? Naruto asked with a sharp tone because he could feel trouble coming from this person. Me? Asked the boy with yellow eyes. Then a black aura appeared around him, which made Naruto's eyes go wide. Then he heard words he couldn't believe. The guy said, I don't know who you can't recognize me, after all. As his grin got even bigger. I am you, said the strange person who looked like Naruto. Then they ran at Naruto so fast that the blonde had a hard time keeping up. The test had just started. Stadium in a place no one knows about. Naruto Uzumaki. Namikaze was upset and confused at the moment. The first thing his sensei did was stab him with a sword. It didn't hurt, but he thought it was wrong. The next morning, he woke up in a strange stadium that looked exactly like Konoha's, but the seats were filled with strange black humanoid things instead of people. He was then attacked by someone who looked exactly like him, except that this weird copycat had yellow eyes and all white clothes. He also had a strange grin that made Naruto very wary of him. Our blonde hero is looking at his clone with a fierce glare, since this guy had just barely missed a punch. He jumped backwards to get more space between them in case the other guy planned to attack again from behind. Who the hell are you? Naruto asked, raising his voice more than he usually does. He couldn't help it, this guy was really bothering him, but his clone got an answer that almost seemed to say, are you stupid? The man who looked like Naruto said, are you clever or what? I already told you, you idiot, I am you. His twisted smirk got bigger with each word. Naruto gave him a mean look because he had no idea what this guy was talking about. The young blonde asked again, what do you mean by that? And where are we anyway? The man was trying to find out as much as possible. When the person who looked like Naruto was asked that question, their smirk turned into an angry face. It looks like this guy was mad that Naruto wasn't giving him enough information. For freaking Kami's sake, do I have to spell everything out for you? Naruto asked with a yellow eye and an annoyed sigh when he saw that his opponent didn't get what was going on. How was he going to enjoy beating the crap out of him if he had no idea what was going on? The man who looked a lot like Naruto said, Okay. I'll answer your stupid questions since I can't stand that stupid look on your face anyway. He then crossed his arms in front of his chest and smiled, this time in a twisted way, with bright yellow eyes. In order to get an answer from this strange clone of him or whatever he was, Naruto chose to ignore the insult. Shadow Naruto told Naruto, first you ask me who I am, and I told you, I am you, or to be more specific, I am your dark side, your hidden feeling, your alter ego. I am your shadow, your true self, the darkness that lives in the deepest part of your soul. Naruto was shocked, but Shadow Naruto was still not done, as his smirk showed. Shadow Naruto said, now about the location. I guess you could say that this place is your inner world or something like that. I don't really know or care, the only thing that matters is that now you're here I can finally deal with you once and for all. Just then, the dark aura from before showed up again, making Naruto stand guard, though his eyes were still filled with confusion. Suddenly, Shadow Naruto laughed. A short time later, that laugh turned into a full on crazy laugh that made Naruto look at his clone like he was crazy, 
which, if you ask him, he probably was. Yes, yes. Is going to be glorious. Once I'm done with you I'll go to where our precious family lives and I'm going to make them pay for what they have done to us. First I'll start with our dear siblings, oh yes, I'll enjoy making them beg for mercy while I torture them one by one, but I won't kill them, no, that would be just too easy. Ha. Huh. Now I know, I'll make them watch how I kill our dear mommy and daddy, yes, that should be good enough but who knows. I may go a little more wild at the end, if you know what I mean. Wait. You probably don't, you are still a virgin after all, all but yelled Shadow Naruto, his crazy laugh starting once again at the end of it. At the same time, Naruto looked at him with fear in his eyes right before he shocked his head to clear his mind of what this guy had said. This guy couldn't possibly be him at all. His relationship with his family was really bad, but he would never be so low as to say something like what this guy did. Our young hero's shadow wasn't over yet, which was sad. And after I deal with them as the village turn. Hell yeah. I'm going to burn that shithole to the ground and I'm going to kill every single person there, oh it's going to be so fun, I can already hear their screams of agony. I'll make the Kiyubi look like a little kitty, they won't even know what hit them, explained Shadow Naruto, pure and simply bloodlust clear in the way he looked. Even though Naruto had no idea what this guy was thinking, he was more sure than ever that this guy couldn't be him or any part of him. In Naruto's mind, there was no way this guy could be him, because he wasn't a monster like this guy. Do you agree? You. You're sick, was all the young Zeref's apprentice could say. At first, he looked shocked, but then he looked disgusted and angry. At that moment, Shadow Naruto stopped laughing and looked at him funny because he must have heard what Naruto just said. Shadow Naruto said, excuse me? I'm sorry? You might want to look at yourself in a mirror there, kid, because all I'm saying is how we really feel and what we really want to do. When Shadow Naruto saw Naruto's angry glare in response to his statement, he smiled again. The young blonde man yelled, you're lying. There's no way you can be me. You are not me. His normally quiet voice broke into a yell at the end of the sentence. Shadow Naruto was covered in an even stronger aura as soon as he was done speaking. This time, random red sparks began to appear around his body. Naruto could feel how powerful this guy was, and the young blonde felt fear for the first time since meeting Reijin. Fear at this guy not only for his power, but also for how willing he was to do so much harm with it. That's what I wanted to hear, Shadow Naruto said with a twisted grin as he moved even faster toward Naruto, his fist full of red electricity. The fight had begun. During this time, Konoha. We need to talk, were the first words the fourth Hokage, Minato Namikaze, heard when he opened the door to his home and saw Orochimaru, one of the legendary three great ninjas. Talk about what, Orochimaru? Did something happen? Asked the blonde Hokage, shining his full attention on the snake summoner. It was very unusual, if not unheard of, for Orochimaru to come to this house. He usually brought his reports to the Hokage's office, never here. Well, I guess you could say that. May I come in? I think it's best that we have this conversation alone, the black. Haired ninja said. His usual creepy smile was gone, and his face was serious, which made Minato and Kashina, who was standing behind her husband, laugh at the snake summoner. It was only, sure, that Minato said before leading Orochimaru to the living room. Orochimaru sat down in one of the chairs around the coffee table, while the hero of the third shinobi war sat on the couch nearby. Kashina spoke for the first time since Orochimaru came into her house. Would you like some tea, Orochimaru? San? She asked. But Orochimaru just shook his head and answered, no. That's not necessary, but I'd appreciate it if you could stay to hear what I have to say. It's important for both of you, Orochimaru quickly replied, his eyes on both the Hokage and his wife. If what he thought would happen was true, this was going to be an interesting conversation. He wasn't sure how they would react to what he was going to say. Both Minato and Kashina looked suspicious when she said that, but neither of them said anything. The Reed Head Junin sat on the couch with her husband, waiting to hear whatever news Orochimaru had to share with them right away. So, what's the problem, Orochimaru? It's about the job I gave you at the academy, right? Minato asked, thinking of something different that could have brought the snake summoner here since he had never done that before. People who knew Orochimaru well said that the man had a slightly cruel side that went well with his desire to learn. For those people, it wasn't a surprise that he was the head of Konoha's torture and interrogation division. 
But only the Hokage, his wife, and a few other people knew that Orochimaru was supposed to keep an eye on the new students and see how they did. The simple reason Minato gave Orochimaru the job was that he thought Orochimaru knew more about human psychology than anyone else in the village. This made him very good at his job at the TNI division. So, Minato gave Orochimaru the job of watching how the academy students grew so that he could put together the best teams by the time the students graduated and so that Orochimaru could find out which students. After a year on the job, Orochimaru told Minato that the way teams were set up should be changed so that Konoha teams would have four genins and two junins instead of three. Genin teams with one junin. Some people on the council said that system would use too many of the village's janin, but Minato went with it because he had no reason to doubt Orochimaru. He was glad he did, because the new system worked even better than the old one because it let the janin focus more on their genin and teach them a wider range of things, and it also made it much more likely for teams to survive. Yes it is. I don't want to waste anyone's time, so I'll get right to the point Minato. How good is your relationship with your son? Orochimatu asked both Minato and Kashina, making one of them frown and the other look like she was thinking about something else. Kashina was worried about her son and asked, why are you asking this? Did something happen to Menma? Kun? She was worried about what might have happened to her son and was even more worried that her son hadn't told her or his father about it. Orochimaru told Kashina, calm down, nothing happened to Menma. Kun at all. He's actually in the top of his class, though he could do better on the written part if you ask me. This made both parents sigh with relief, even though the black. Haired snake summoner was now even busier, since he knew they had only asked for one of their sons. When Minato asked, why are you asking then? He looked and spoke like he was confused. That was a bit of a miscommunication, so let me be clearer this time. How well do you get along with your son Naruto? Kun? Right then, Orochimaru saw a response that confirmed all of his suspicions. This made him sigh inwardly because it made everything harder. When Orochimaru asked him a question, both Minato and Kashina looked at him with an expression that was hard to read. Their eyes grew so big that they looked like plates, and then they both looked at each other with the same expression. Nothing in this made Orochimaru do anything but raise an eyebrow. Although the young practitioner of the Flying Thunder God technique, Hiraishin no Jutsu, thought about the question, he did not like the answer he was receiving. It had taken him only a few seconds to remember that he had another son besides Menma, and no matter how hard he tried to remember any memories with his first son, he was unable to do so, as if he had forgotten all about him. This made M.I. feel bad. Even though Kashina's thoughts were even crazier than her husband's, she unfortunately couldn't remember any time she spent with her son. She thought hard about important events like birthdays, training days, and their first day at the academy, but she couldn't picture him in any of them, which hurt her deeply. How could she not remember anything about one of her sons? How could she have forgotten about him like that? Do you agree? The cough from Orochimaru broke the focus of both the Hokage and her wife's thoughts. He knew enough about people to know the answer to his question just by looking at them. It was Orochimaru who said, I'm going to guess that it's not good, isn't it? Well that explains a part of the problem. The last part was said in a low voice, but they could both hear it. What are you talking about, Orochimaru? Did something happen to Naru? Kun at the academy? Kashina almost yelled as she stood up, her face filled with panic and fear. If something did happen to her son at the academy, like him having to repeat a year of it because she and her husband didn't help him when they should have, she would never be able to forgive herself. To calm his wife down, Minato stood up and put his hand on her shoulder, but Orochimaru could see that the fourth fire shadow was also worried about his son. He was just better at keeping his feelings in check, which Orochimaru liked about him. No, nothing at all Kashina, Naruto. Kun's progress in the academy is pretty normal. His grades aren't great, but they aren't bad either. In fact, if you ask me, I'd say they are too. Regular, Orochimaru answered, crossing his arms over his chest and looking at the two strong ninja in front of him, who were once again not sitting on the couch, waiting for the inevitable question. What do you mean by that? Minato asked with a frown that showed he was worried about his son and felt bad that he seemed to have forgotten all about him, which he thought made him a bad father. Kashina's eyes were on the floor, but it was clear that her mind was somewhere else. She was probably trying to find a moment to spend with her first child, but she couldn't. Suddenly, she had another thought that almost made her cry, she couldn't even remember what her son looked like. The only thing she could remember about him was that he looked a lot like Menma. 
but she couldn't remember anything else about him, not even what clothes he wears or how she bought them for him. Having all of these thoughts made the former Kiyubi container feel like the worst mother ever. She couldn't believe she had forgotten about her son under Kami's name. What I mean is that your son scores in the academy or two. Unnatural if you ask me. First are the written test, in those exams your son always get half of the answers wrong while the other one are correct, meaning he gets half of the top score of the test. Now I can understand that happening sometimes, but the fact is that in the two and a half year young Naruto. Kun has been in the academy he has always got the same points in every written exam. Almost like he did this on purpose, said Orochimaru, observing how Minato's how Kashina's attention moved from the floor to himself. Now if we look at your son's grades in the practical part of the academy, we can see the same pattern, always half of the maximum score for any practical lesson, and when it comes to taijutsu, Naruto. Kun's progress is just a little better than the average. That makes sense, since it seems like you haven't been helping him at all in that area, Orochimaru said. Both Minato and Kashina jumped, but not because of his voice. When the Hokage and his wife heard that, they were both shocked. They knew that Sasaki Uchiha, daughter of their friends Fugaku and Makoto Uchiha, was one of the best students at the academy and was tied with their daughter for Kunoichi of the year. So how could their son, who hadn't had any special training, beat her so easily? It made both of them feel even worse about their own skills. So, after looking at all of these facts, I decided that I think your son is hiding his real skills at the academy, Orochimaru said, shocking both Minato and Kashina once more. The Red. Headed Beauty asked, W. What? Why would he do that? She didn't understand why her son would lie about his skills in the academy. That wasn't exactly how a boy his age would act. The way Minato thought was a little different. That would mean that his son had been training if what Orochimaru said was true, because he couldn't have been strong enough to beat Sasaki without training. But if that were true, then who trained him? There was a small chance that he trained by himself, but that was very unlikely. This meant that someone had been helping his son with his ninja training, but who? I'm not him, so I can't say for sure, but I think it was because he didn't want anyone to know how strong he really was, Orochimaru said with a sigh, knowing that what he was about to say would make them both very angry. Given what I know about Naruto. Kun, I have to say that I have to consider him a flight risk right now, Orochimaru said. Almost as soon as he said that, he was hit by two powerful killer instincts from both Minato and Kashina, whose powerful gaze was focused on the snake summoner. Are you suggesting that my son, Orochimaru, could turn traitor? Minato asked with a cold voice and a strong glare. He would never let anyone say something like that to a member of his family, ever. You have to face the facts Minato. First he hides his true abilities in the academy, abilities that we have no idea from where he got them since I know you're also thinking that someone must have been teaching him for a while, but you and I have no idea of the who, then it's the fact that your son has no bonds of importance with the exception of his relationship with Sasaki Uchiha, which probably started not so long ago, and then we can add the fact that, for what I can see he does not even has a good relationship with his family. And you don't need to be an expert to notice that Naruto. Kun holds no love for this village, something that you two could have fixed if you paid enough attention, but you didn't, and for that I can easily tell you that your son has no true reasons for staying in this village, let alone protect it with his life, so yes Minato, I do consider your son a flight risk, and after he graduates from the academy he could easily become a traitor to the leaf, said Orochimaru with steel on his voice, after all he was not going to let this two intimidate him for simply stating a fact. Although these two didn't really have the power to scare Orochimaru, their desire to kill was much weaker than his. There was a brief moment of silence followed by a fierce exchange of looks between the three cage. Level ninjas. The tension was so high that even a rusty kanai could cut through it. This was the only thing Orochimaru had to say when Minato asked him in a cold voice. The snake summoner just nodded and stood up next to the blonde Hokage. He had already done his job, so there wasn't much reason for him to stay. As the head of the T&I department walked out the door, Minato said, Orochimaru. He still had some things to say before he left, though. What is it, Minato? Orochimaru asked with a raised eyebrow, still not sure what the fourth fire shadow wanted to say to him. Just. Thank you. For telling me all of this. Orochimaru said, I was just doing my job. Now it's your turn to fix this before something happens. And then he left in a leaf shunshin no jutsu, body flicker technique. He still had one more thing to do. As the blonde Hokage entered the house and thought about what had happened, he said, don't worry, I will. 
He said this to himself more than to anyone else. What made him such a bad parent? He remembered how it was to grow up without a family, he was an orphan, and how he didn't feel truly happy until his sensei and father figure started to train him. That's why he promised himself that he would be the best father he could be to his children, so they could have the happiness that comes with having a family that he didn't have in his early years. But it looked like he had failed in some way. At the same time, Kashina was thinking about what had happened all night in the living room. The more she tried to remember anything about Naruto, the worse mother she was becoming. At first, she couldn't believe she had forgotten about one of her sons that easily. Since her clan was destroyed, Kashina had always wanted a big family. She had promised herself that she would do anything to make that family happy, but it looks like she didn't keep her word. What kind of mother would ignore her son like that? The Uzumaki. Namikaze matriarch was distracted by a soft touch on the shoulder. When she saw that it was her husband with the sad face, she finally let go of everything she was holding on to and began to cry while hugging her husband as tightly as she could. Minato did his best to comfort her. As Kashina sobbed, she asked, how did we forget about him, Minato? Kun? She was afraid of how bad her relationship with her first child really was. I don't know Kushi. Chan, I don't know. But we're going to fix this no matter what, Minato said. Her wife nodded in his chest, and the sobs in her ear got quieter. At that moment, they both promised themselves that they would find a way to get back in touch with their son, no matter how hard it might be. That promise would last forever. At the same time, Orochimaru. The powerful snake summoner showed up in his personal office, which was a small room with just a wooden desk, a chair, and a bookcase full of snake. Themed books. There were some torches lighting the room up. You could find his secret lab here. Only he, the Hokage, and a few other people, like his teammates, knew about it. It was here that Orochimaru usually did his experiments. Of course, he couldn't use regular people as test subjects unless they were prisoners or someone else the Hokage gave his permission, and even then, only if Orochimaru was sure the procedure wouldn't kill the person. He had to tell his pregnant teammate how much he appreciated her one of these days. She had really helped raise the patient's chances of survival. On top of his desk, Orochimaru had some papers lying around. He sat down and began to think about things that happened in the past. Yes, he could remember times when he would have easily kidnapped a civilian or ninja and experimented on him. If anyone had found out, he would have just left the village, since he didn't really care about it, but as soon as he met him, all of those thoughts and plans went out the window. He was still scared when he thought about the day he met that monster. The only thing Orochimaru wanted more than learning all the secrets of the world was to never have to face that monster again. He was sure that he would not make it through a second time. The snake summoner looked past the old person and toward the new person who had just shown up using the body flicker technique, just as he had asked her to. Even though this person was wearing the standard Anbu uniform, it was clear that she was a woman. She wore an Anbu mask that looked like a snake on her face, just like all the other ANBUs on duty. Her hair behind her mark was black with a blue tint and styled in a short, spiky, fan ponytail. You had sensei call? Asked the female Anbu in a chirp tone, her hands on her hips. Orochimaru could almost feel his apprentice's smirk behind her mask, and he had to hold back a sigh of relief. He knew that his little apprentice would never change, even though she was now in Anbu. He just wished she would stop bothering him so much. I did, yes. Do you understand that you should not tell anyone, not even the Hokage, about this important task I have for you? Orochimaru never liked to leave things up to chance, so it wasn't a big surprise that he also wanted to solve the mystery of Naruto Uzumaki. Namikaze. He wasn't doing this for the village or anything. He wanted to do it for more personal reasons. Anko. Following the few times Orochimaru had seen the boy in person, he was barely able to hold back his shock and shiver. With each passing year, the boy's presence began to become more like his, which was something that only he could sense. That meeting changed his life. Naruto Uzumaki. Namikaze's life was about to get more difficult, and there was nothing he could do about it. In the meantime, in the training room. If you looked closely, you could see Zarif sitting on the ground, his full attention on his apprentice's slumped body. The powerful dark mage knew what his apprentice was going through and thought it must be one of the hardest things anyone could ever go through. After all, facing your own inner demons and accepting them as part of you is something that almost no one can do. 
This is why so many mages in his world lost themselves when they started to use any kind of Yami no Maho, darkness magic. There were some who were able to control their own darkness, but they were wasting the real power of this type of magic by doing that. If you asked Zaref what the best way was to become a master of Yami no Maho, darkness magic, he would say this one. Some parts of him did wonder if he had done the same thing or if he had put his only student in a death trap, but he quickly pushed those thoughts aside because he had full faith in his student and knew that if anyone could handle this challenge and succeed, it was his student. There was a strong presence that filled the room after a few more minutes of just staring at his apprentice. If Naruto had seen his sensei at that moment, he would have been shocked. His sensei's normally emotional face turned into a powerful glare when he felt the presence. I asked Alcor, what are you doing here? Zaref asked out of the blue. His voice had a danger tone that almost no one in this world has ever heard, and for a split second, you could see his normally black eyes flash red. Is that how you treat a friend, Zaref? Kun? Asked a smooth voice that seemed to reverberate throughout the room. But Zaref's attention was drawn to a corner of the training room where a figure began to emerge from the shadows. In this picture, there was a figure that looked like a male teenager, probably between the ages of 17 and 18. This person has very pale skin, curly white hair, and squinted eyes that made him look sleepy. He wears a red and black striped shirt with a frilled undershirt, black pants, and shoes that match. We're not that Alcor. Now tell me, what brought you here? What are you doing? Zaref asked, aiming a strong glare at the man with the mane named Alcor. The man's smile didn't change at all. In fact, it seemed to get bigger. That hostile tone of yours really hurts me, but I guess I can't do anything about it now, can I? Asked the man with white hair, ignoring Zaref's question with a smile. As Zaref revealed Alcor's identity, he asked, What does your master want this time, servant of the Shinigami? But the man didn't seem to care and instead began walking toward Zaref with a smile still on his face. I think the answer to that question is pretty clear, don't you think? Alcor asked, pointing to Naruto's sleeping form with his eyes. But as soon as he did that, a dark lord with angry red eyes and a brighter glare grabbed him and choked him. When Zaref started training Naruto, he became more angry and said, If you ever put a finger on him, Alcor, I'll kill you. He had never trusted this man, just like he had never trusted this man's master. Since the Shinigami brought him into the world, he had never felt thankful for what he did because he knew the Shinigami had done it for his own reasons and not out of any kindness. He won't let any of them touch his apprentice, not even if it means fighting a god. Zaref was putting a lot of pressure on Alcor's neck, but the man with white hair kept smiling as if nothing was wrong. Then, as if by magic, Alcor disappeared from Zaref's grasp and reappeared behind him, hand on his mouth as if he was trying not to laugh. While Zaref stared at the Shinigami servant with white hair, Alcor said, I'm sure you will Zaref. Kun, but don't worry about that. My master just told me to come here and take a look after all. Zaref's gaze was still on our blonde hero, who was standing still. I see that you used the gift that my master gave you, Alcor said after a short pause, as if it were true. When Zaref heard about the Shinigami's gift, he looked at the back of his right hand. As he did, a symbol appeared there. The only thing this black symbol showed was the kanji for death. To the untrained eye, it looked like a tattoo. But Zaref knew it wasn't a tattoo because it was one of the two gifts the Shinigami gave him when he was born. The mark on his right hand was one of those gifts. The mark served two purposes. The first was to let the Shinigami, and by extension Alcor, know where Zaref was at all times. This was because the Shinigami wanted to make sure Zaref didn't cross the line by doing something he might find bad. Zaref liked the other thing it did, it kept his powers in check. Because of this, Zaref could say what he wanted to say without worrying about killing everyone around him, which was a big problem in his old world. There was a very different gift the other one. It was the sword Zaref had used to send Naruto's conscience deep into his soul. Zaref could do many things with the souls of both living and dead people with that sword, but the Dark Lord only used it in very specific situations because he didn't want to use something that the Shinigami had given him, and Zaref had only been able to meet the conditions to use its most powerful power twice in his lifetime in the elemental nations. That I did. And you're sure he was ready for that? Naruto. Kun is still young after all. I have complete trust in my apprentice Alcor. I don't need you doubting that. He looked at Naruto with great focus, as if he were the answer to a puzzle he was trying to solve. I see. 
he said, ending the conversation. Finally, after a few more seconds of intense staring, or glaring at Zarif, Alcor let out a small laugh and then walked back to one of the corners of the training room. When he got there, he did nothing but stare at Zarif again, smiling as he did so. Zarif said in a threatening voice, I'm really excited to see how far Naruto. Kun goes with someone like you teaching him Zarif. Kun. Just make sure you don't fail him as a teacher, after all he's one of the few interesting humans that exist, it would be a shame for him to not be able to face what's coming. Zarif then disappeared, as if he had never been there. The Dark Lord Zarif just let out a sigh when he heard that. His eyes went back to being black, and he looked at his student again as he paced. He thought about why the Shinigami was so interested in Naruto, but in the end it didn't matter because him and the gods were dealing with other things. But he was sure of one thing, his apprentice would go through a lot of hard times. And just like he told him the first time they met, he would help him in any way he could, even if it meant facing the Shinigami or another god. Yes, Zarif would show them how powerful the most powerful dark mage ever was if it meant helping Naruto in any way. After all, Naruto was his only family. And just like Mavis said she would give her life to protect her family, Zarif would do the same, even if it meant giving up his own soul. In the meantime, in the training room. You could see Zarif sitting on the ground right now if you looked hard enough. He was looking at his apprentice's past. Out body with all of his attention. The strong dark mage knew what his apprentice was going through, and he thought it must be one of the hardest things anyone could ever go through. After all, Facing your own inner demons and accepting them as part of you is something that almost no one can do. This is why so many mages in his world lost themselves when they started to use any kind of Yami no Maho, darkness magic. There were some who were able to control their own darkness, but they were wasting the real power of this type of magic by doing that. If you asked Zarif what the best way was to become a master of Yami no Maho, darkness magic, he would say this one. Some parts of him did wonder if he had done the same thing or if he had put his only student in a death trap but he quickly pushed those thoughts aside because he had full faith in his student and knew that if anyone could handle this challenge and succeed, it was his student. There was a strong presence that filled the room after a few more minutes of just staring at his apprentice. If Naruto had seen his sensei at that moment, he would have been shocked. His sensei's normally emotional face turned into a powerful glare when he felt the presence. What are you doing here, Alcor? Zarif asked out of the blue. His voice had a threatening tone that almost no one in this world has ever heard, and for a split second, you could see his normally black eyes flash red. Is that how you treat a friend, Zarif? Kun? Asked a smooth voice that seemed to reverberate through the room. Zarif turned his attention to a corner of the training room where a figure began to emerge from the shadows. There was no doubt that this person was a teenager, a boy, probably between the ages of 17 and 18. The person in question has very light, curly white hair. He looked sleepy because his eyes were squinting, and the makeup and eyelashes around his eyes are white. He wears a striped red and black shirt under a frilled black shirt, shoes that match, and black pants. We're not that Alcor. Now tell me, what did you come here to do? Zarif asked, glaring hard at the man with the mane called Alcor. The man's smile didn't change at all. In fact, it looked like it got bigger. That anger of yours really hurt me, but I guess I can't do anything about it now, can I? The white. Haired man asked Zarif with a smile, ignoring his question. Shield. Servant. What does your master want this time? As Zarif asked, he revealed that the man was Alcor. Of course, this didn't change the man's mind. He just walked closer to Zarif with a smile on his face. Do you agree that the answer to that question is pretty clear? Alcor said, pointing to Naruto's sleeping form with his eyes. But as soon as he did that, he felt a hand around his neck from a dark lord with angry red eyes and a brighter glare. Hest Zarif, showing more emotion than usual. Ever since he started training Naruto, he had never trusted this man, and he had never trusted this man's master either. He had never felt thankful to the Shinigami for bringing him into the world, because he knew that the Shinigami had done it for his own reasons and not out of kindness. If he did feel grateful, it would be for the wrong reasons. He won't let any of them touch his apprentice, not even if it means fighting a god. The white. Haired man kept smiling even though Zarif was putting a lot of pressure on his neck, as if nothing was happening. Then, as if by magic, Alcor disappeared from Zarif's grasp and reappeared behind him, hand on his mouth because he was trying not to laugh. While Zarif stared at the Shinigami servant with white hair, Alcor said, I'm sure you will Zarif. Kun, 
but don't worry about that. My master just told me to come here and take a look after all. Zaref's gaze was still on our blonde hero, who was standing still. I see that you used the gift that my master gave you, Alcor said after a short pause, as if it were true. When the Shinigami's gift was mentioned, Zaref looked at the back of his right hand and a black kanji character for death appeared there. To someone else, it might have looked like a tattoo, but Zaref knew it wasn't because it was one of the two gifts the Shinigami gave him when he was born. The mark on his right hand was one of those gifts. It served two purposes. The first was to let the Shinigami, and by extension Alcor, know where he was at all times. This was because the Shinigami wanted to make sure Zaref didn't cross the line by doing anything he might consider problematic. The second purpose was something Zaref liked, it kept his powers in check. This let Zaref say what he really wanted to say. The other gift was very different. It was the sword Zaref had used to send Naruto's conscience deep into his soul. That sword had many powers over the souls of both living and dead people, but the Dark Lord only used it in very specific situations because he didn't want to use something the Shinigami had given him, and the only way to use its strongest power was to S. That I did. Are you sure he was ready for that? After all, Naruto. Kun is still young. I have complete trust in my apprentice Alcor. I don't need you doubting that. I see. Said the white. Haired man leaving Naruto to sleep while staring at him with great concentration, as if he were the key to a puzzle he was trying to solve. After a few more seconds of intense staring, or glaring in Zaref's case, Alcor let out a small laugh and walked back to a corner of the training room, where he stared at Zaref again, greeting his harsh glare with a smile. I'm really excited to see how far Naruto. Kun goes after you teach him Zaref. Kun. Just don't fail him as a teacher. He's one of the few interesting people in the world, and it would be a shame for him to not be able to handle what's coming," Zaref said in a threatening tone before disappearing, as if he had never been there. When Zaref, the Dark Lord, heard that, he let out a sigh and turned his eyes back to their normal black color. He looked at his pacing student again and wondered why the Shinigami was so interested in Naruto. But in the end, it didn't matter to him because God's business wasn't his business. But he was sure of one thing, his apprentice would go through a lot of hard times. And just like he told him the first time they met, he would help him in any way he could, even if it meant facing the Shinigami or another god. Yes, Zaref would show them how powerful the most powerful dark mage ever was if it meant helping Naruto in any way. After all, Naruto was his only family. And just like Mavis said she would give her life to protect her family, Zaref would do the same, even if it meant giving up his own soul. That's when Naruto heard the words, Rare you know Tekken, lighting dragon's iron fist. His fist, which was covered in red lighting and slammed into his face by Shadow Naruto, sent him flying to the other side of the stadium. After a short time, Naruto was able to skit to a stop quickly enough to see Shadow Naruto running straight at him with his hand again covered in red light, but this time it was in the shape of a claw instead of a fist. Shadow Naruto yelled, Rare you know Saiga, lighting dragon's crushing fang. And then swept his right arm across Naruto as he finally caught up to him. Luckily for the blonde, he jumped out of the way of the attack just in time, because when Shadow Naruto's attack hit the ground, it made a big crack in it because the spell was cutting. After putting more space between himself and his shadow, Naruto thought, my turn. The young blonde began to prepare his attack with magic in his mouth, and Shadow Naruto seemed to have the same idea. Rare you know Hoko, Lighting Dragon's roar, was yelled by both Naruto and his shadow before they cast the powerful blue and red lighting spells. Both attacks hit each other in the middle, making a big explosion that made Naruto cover his eyes with his arm. That was a bad idea, because the next thing he felt was Shadow Naruto's powerful lighting. Improved kick, which sent the young blonde flying to the other side of the stadium just like his fist had. Damn it, Naruto thought as he stood up and held his stomach. He looked at his shadow with a strong glare, but the shadow just stood there with a smirk on his face, thinking about how weak his good side was. Shadow Naruto said, I hope you step up your game. This wouldn't be fun if all I did was handle you like a ragdoll. He then ran at Naruto again, but this time his feet were charged with red electricity. Shadow Naruto said, Rare you know Kajizum, lighting dragon's claw, and then threw a high kick at Naruto in the face. The young apprentice to Zaref, on the other hand, dodged the attack by bending down just in time. Naruto jumped at the chance and filled his fist with blue light right before he threw it at his shadow's face. 
The bad news is that his true self quickly turned his head to avoid the punch and grabbed Naruto's wrist just as he slammed a powerful hook into his ribs. The young Zarif apprentice didn't have time to react, though, because Shadow Naruto hit him in the stomach with a perfect knee, making him arc over in pain and baldness. But Shadow Naruto wasn't done yet. He felt another hook, this time to the face from the hand that Shadow Naruto had just released from grabbing his wrist. There was pain all over Naruto's body as he stumbled away from his shadow. But he had been through worse when sparring with his sensei, so he turned around and made a swinging motion in front of him that looked like an X with his blue lit arms. Naruto yelled, Rareyu no Yokugeki, lighting dragon's wing attack. And then let go of the energy in his arms after swinging them, sending a powerful X. Shaped beam of light the size of his torso straight at his shadow. But that shadow wasn't scared because when he saw what his normal self was going to do, he also got ready for his own attack by charging his fist with lightning and then throwing a perfect jab at him, letting out all the energy he had built up. Rareyu no Hoken, lighting dragon's breakdown fist. Shadow Naruto yelled, and a fist the size of a person made of red light shot out of him and hit Naruto's spell. No luck for that blonde, though, because Naruto's attack missed the huge fist and hit him directly in the body, sending waves of pain through the young woman's whole body. Naruto could only scream in pain as he fell to the ground face first after being hit by the powerful spell. Shadow Naruto, on the other hand, started to walk toward the blonde who had fallen. He did so with a smirk on his face and confidence in his eyes, even though they were always crazy. Shadow Naruto spoke to him like he was a child. You know, this wouldn't be happening if you weren't such a pussy and went to get revenge on those who hurt us. But no, you had to be the good guy and do shit, well I'm tired of that. Don't we deserve to have our way with those jerks we're related to? Don't we deserve to turn our anger on the weak village of Konoha? I think we do. But since you don't have the guts to do it, I'll have to do it myself. Don't worry, I promise that all of them will suffer. That's what we really want, isn't it? Shadow Naruto said in a serious voice. Shut up. That's not what I want. I'm not a monster like you. Naruto yelled at him as he tried to stand up, giving him a mean look. He only raised an eyebrow and let out a sigh. Forget it, the shadow said with a sly grin. I'm sick of trying to make you understand, so you can just die already. His hand was full of red electricity and shaped like a claw. Shadow Naruto pointed the attack right at Naruto's neck and said, Rareyu no Saiga, lighting dragon's crushing fang. That's when Shadow Naruto was sure he had won. The sound he heard after the attack wasn't what he thought it would be, though. Puff. After using his Kawarimi no Jutsu, body replacement technique, Naruto just cut a log of wood in half. Shadow Naruto yelled, what? When his original self threw the kanai at him, the shadow of Naruto barely had time to turn around and catch it. He didn't even have time to think about where the log had come from. Naruto just smiled and said, really? This is all you have at this point? I have to say I'm disappointed in you. Shadow Naruto said this with a deadpan look, separating his counter like he was an idiot. Someone making a noise with the kanai in Shadow Naruto's hand stopped him from asking what was so funny. When he looked at the kanai, he couldn't stop the course to speak. I cursed, fuck me sideways, as Shadow Naruto let go of the kanai, but it was too late. The paper bomb Naruto had put there went off right away, sending a lot of smoke into the air and hurting Shadow Naruto. That's it, you little jerk. You're dead, and as soon as I get my hands on you, I'm going to rip you apart. Yelled an angry Shadow Naruto as he was still recovering from the explosion. His body and clothes had some burns here and there, but it would take a lot more to really hurt or kill someone like him. It surprised Shadow Naruto when, from the cloud of smoke that the explosion created, at least a dozen shuriken came flying at him. He was able to block them with his own kanais, but he wasn't able to avoid the powerful spear. Like blue lightning that hit him right in the chest, setting off an explosion of electricity that made Shadow Naruto curse after being hit by what he recognized as the Rayu attack. Naruto wasn't done yet, though, because he was moving very quickly towards Shadow Naruto. If you paid close enough attention, you could see that something was wrong with this Naruto, but Shadow Naruto was too angry to notice. He met Naruto halfway and slammed his fist into his face, but to his surprise, the attack went right through him. A copy. Shadow Naruto thought that, but it was too late. The real Naruto, who was hiding behind the clone, cut the distance between him and his shadow and hit him hard with an uppercut that lifted him off the ground. 
Naruto wasn't going to miss this chance, though, so he jumped backwards quickly and cast another spell, hoping that would end the fight. Naruto used, Ryu no Hoko, Lighting Dragon's Roar. The powerful lighting roar hit Shadow Naruto while he was on the ground and caused another explosion. Naruto stood there for a moment, trying to catch his breath while looking at the cloud of smoke that his attack had created. His eyes widened in shock when he saw a black energy projectile coming from the smoke at too high of speed for him to avoid. When he tried, the attack went through his shoulder completely, making him growl in pain and put his hand over it to stop the bleeding. Now I'm really mad. I was going to make this quick, but now I just want to. Break you, Shadow Naruto hissed when he appeared after the cloud of smoke went away. He looked awful because his clothes were torn in some places and blood was running through his chest and mouth. Now angry, Shadow Naruto raised his hand and pointed at Naruto. Suddenly, several black magic circles the size of his head appeared around him. Shadow Naruto spoke, Kuroi Yajirushi, Kantsu, Dark Arrows, piercing, before each circle sent the same type of black projectiles, each about the size of a kanai, straight at Naruto. Yami no Maho, Darkness Magic, was clearly shown to that blonde, and he was stunned for a moment. But he quickly recovered in time to start dodging the arrows that Shadow Naruto had called up. Even though he was able to avoid many of the projectiles, Naruto wasn't ready when Shadow Naruto split some of them in midair, making two of each arrow and changing their path so that Naruto couldn't avoid them in time. He screamed in pain, gah. After several of those arrows went through his shoulders, legs, arms, and thighs. In the end, the young blonde fell to his knees in pain. The blood loss from each of his wounds made it a little hard for him to see. The blonde looked up while on his knees and saw Shadow Naruto already there, with anger on his face instead of his usual smirk. This is what he was aware. Shadow Naruto told the blonde, this is your loss, but now I'll enjoy this as much as I can. He then began to kick her, and she fell to the ground face first. With each hit, her conscience faded away. Am I going to die here? Without getting anything done? Am I really this weak? Were the thoughts going through Naruto's head? He couldn't believe this fake was going to get him killed. Another memory came to him when he thought about being a fake, the words his sensei had told him before sending him here about how some people hid their darkness while others let it control them, and that he would have to accept that part of himself if he wanted to be strong. Although Naruto shook his head, he knew that he would never believe that someone like that was a part of him. He wasn't a monster, and he would never kill just for the fun of it. Another memory of his lookalike came back to him, I promise you that all of them will suffer. After all, that's what we really want, isn't it? Of course, if you asked Naruto, he would say that he didn't want revenge on his biological family and didn't even care about them to get revenge. Naruto knew the truth. No matter how hard he tried to hide it, there would always be a part of him that wanted to just hurt them and make them feel pain like they made him feel for so many years. His father figure was the only thing that kept him from turning into a crazy person out for revenge like his shadow. At that very moment, Naruto had an insight, this person who called himself his shadow. If Zarif hadn't been there, he might have turned into someone who let hate run his life. As Naruto watched the fight, he could see that, like him, he felt betrayed by his biological family in every way. But while Naruto had Zarif, this guy didn't have anyone. For the first seven years of his life, just like him. This person. He's like me. Doesn't he? No, I haven't said that since he told me, but. That was just me not wanting to face my worst feelings. I don't want to believe that I have someone inside me who is like him, but. That doesn't matter in the end. He is me, right? Wow. Naruto thought as he looked up at his shadow, which had stopped kicking him a moment ago and was now puffing a lot. Shadow Naruto didn't seem to notice Naruto's change of mind, though, since Naruto was about to kill him. Reiryu no Saiga, Lighting Dragon's Crushing Fang. Shadow Naruto hissed as he threw the powerful claw. Like attack at Naruto's neck again. No. I'm not going to lose. I need to give it shape with my magic and a goal with my mind, Naruto thought just before the attack hit him. He remembered what his sensei had said about how Yami no Maho, darkness magic, worked. If you looked at it from Shadow Naruto's point of view, his magic and darkness answered his mental call, and a completely black chain appeared from where his hand was on the ground and stopped Shadow Naruto's attack by attaching itself to his arm. What? But how did you? Shadow Naruto said something, 
but it got stuck in his throat when he saw Naruto lying on his back and holding what looked like a black sphere the size of his palm. You could almost feel how strong the spell was, and Shadow Naruto knew that from this far away, it would be easy for that spell to kill. Naruto used all the strength he still had to move just before throwing the powerful mass of magic directly at his shadow. Shadow Naruto was either too stunned to move or couldn't move because of the chain, but it didn't matter because the black sphere hit him in the chest, causing another explosion and a scream of pain from Shadow Naruto. Naruto gathered all of his strength to stand up and walk toward his shadows now. Dead body. His shadow had a fist. Sized hole in his chest, which would have killed anyone else, but Naruto could tell that his shadow was still alive because his eyes were getting dim. He didn't have much time to figure out what this meant. How could you use that magic? Shadow Naruto asked between bloody coughs. He wanted to know how his weaker self was able to do something that the day before was impossible. Naruto spoke with all the fire he could muster, I accepted what you said. It's true, there is a part of me that wants to see them suffer. But I won't let that control me. You might be me, but I won't become like you. No, I won't let their neglect turn me into a monster. I'm stronger than that, and you know it. He was surprised when this made Shadow Naruto laugh a little, though he could see that his Shadow W. He. I guess I underestimated you, didn't I? Shadow Naruto said with a painful smile right before a golden aura covered his body. But that wasn't the only thing that happened as Shadow Naruto's body began to fade away. You better get strong. Next time I won't hold back at all. Were the last words Shadow Naruto spoke before he vanished. His body turned into many golden lights that floated into the sky. Naruto smiled and looked at everything with a sad face. He promised himself that he would get as strong as he could now that he had passed this hellish test. The young blonde was already pushed to his limit, though, so it wasn't a surprise when he fell to the ground face first, eyes closed and body badly hurt. He still had a smile on his face, though. In the end, he won the fight. After a week, the training room. Zareph was definitely a patient person. Because he had to meditate and control his magic for years, he learned the virtue of patience. That's why it didn't surprise anyone who knew him to find him in the same place he'd been for over a week, giving his full attention to his 14. Year. Old apprentice while she slept. It's been a week since Zareph sent Naruto's conscience to the deepest part of what people call their souls. While most people would have been freaking out when they realized they were killing someone, the black. Haired mage was actually pretty calm. He was able to keep his cool because he knew how the test worked. After the first day, his apprentice's magic went from being chaotic to normal, so he knew that everything was okay. People usually think someone who hasn't slept in a week is crazy, but Zareph found more rest in meditating than in sleeping. He couldn't stop the nightmares about all the horrible things he did on his world, and he knew that they would probably follow him around for the rest of his life here. Even so, since he stopped getting older, his life might be too long for his own comfort. Alcor had told him that he still had all of his powers in this world, including his immortality, which was created by his experiment with the black arts. This did surprise him a little. Therefore, the Shinigami gave Zareph that seal to keep his magic under control. However, the seal did not affect his immortality, so Zareph would continue to live until someone found a way to kill him again. Unlike last time, he wasn't in a hurry to die this time because he had more than one duty to complete before he could accept it. One of those duties was to make sure that his apprentice was ready for whatever was going to happen in the future, whether it was something from the Akatsuki group or something more dangerous Zareph didn't know. He wouldn't let his apprentice face anything without first preparing him. Zareph knew his apprentice was awake when he heard a groan of pain and then felt his body move. This made Zareph let out a sigh of relief, because if what he had heard from outside was true, then Naruto should come back as soon as possible. Damn my back, was the first thing Naruto said as he straightened up in his seat with one hand on the bridge of his nose to try to stop the headache he could feel coming on. He told Zareph, that's what happens when you sleep on the floor for a week. This caught the attention of his apprentice. Naruto said with a smug look on his face, you could have moved me to a bed. And risk something happening to you? I don't think so, Zareph told his apprentice. The apprentice stood up and stretched, which made some of his bones crack. After a short pause, Zareph asked directly, what happened? Naruto didn't even need to ask to understand what his sensei was talking about. It was clear. So, 
Zarif's young apprentice told his sensei everything that happened after he woke up in that strange stadium, from meeting his shadow to the fight and how he beat him and eventually accepted his shadow as a part of himself. While this was going on, Zarif stood there and listened intently to his apprentice's story. He felt more and more proud of himself because he had done something that almost no one else had, he had accepted his darkness and then controlled it. Sensei and apprentice stood there without saying anything after Naruto finished his story. That is, until the young blonde asked him a question that had been bothering him ever since he started fighting his shadow. A confused Naruto asked, Sensei, how come my shadow's attacks hurt me? Isn't it supposed to protect me from lightning? This was because his sensei had told him everything about his Kaminari no Metsuri Umaho, lighting dragon slayer magic, and one of the benefits of this magic was that it protected its user from lightning. Naruto, you need to understand something first. What you just saw wasn't a battle of mages. It was a battle of wills. While you and your shadow cast spells, they were just ways to show how strong your wills were. They were not real magic. So, neither of you could eat the other's lightning spells. This is also why, once you accepted him as a part of you, you were able to use what looked like Yami no Maho, darkness magic, so perfectly. You were giving him power by thinking he was someone else when he was actually you, which is also why he got stronger every time you turned him down, Zarif explained. His apprentice nodded in agreement, but the dark mage wasn't done yet. Naruto. Kun, I know you'd like to start training in Yami no Maho, darkness magic, again because it would be easier for you now that you've accepted your darkness, but training will be cancelled for the rest of the week, Zarif told Naruto. Naruto's apprentice looked surprised because this was the first time his sensei had said something like this. Why, why? Naruto asked with a serious face. There had to be a good reason for his sensei's choices, since he knew the man would never do something like this just for fun. Zarif could only sigh, knowing that what he was about to say would have an effect on his apprentice. Zarif stopped Naruto in his tracks by raising his hand. Naruto. Kun, the reason for that is that I need you to lay low for a while. It had been a week since Naruto started the task, Zarif continued with his usual emotionless face, not surprised at all when his blonde apprentice's eyes widened in surprise. But how? How is that even possible? Asked Naruto, trying to calm down before he spoke. He thanked his training for helping him control his feelings, since his first reaction was to jump and scream. What happened, Naruto? Kun? Even though you passed the test in just one day, it took a full week for your magical core to stabilize and for your body and mind to get used to the changes that happened when you accepted your shadow and the Yami no Maho magic that came with it. Because of that, you fell into a coma that lasted a week, I need you to stay out of sight for a while. Since you haven't been to school for a week, Someone might get suspicious, and we can't have anyone finding this place or learning about your relationship with me," Zarif said, getting a small nod of agreement from his apprentice. The apprentice still looked a little confused about what he had learned, but since he couldn't think of a reason for his s. Besides that, that really explained why he was so hungry. Zarif couldn't help but think about what his apprentice would do if he told him that the real reason he wanted Naruto to take it easy for a while was because Naruto's family had finally decided to pay attention to him. When Zarif's spy told him what was going on with the Hokage and his family, he thought, they couldn't have picked a worse time. It's already late, Naruto. Kun, and tomorrow is your first day at the academy because it's Sunday. I think you should go home and rest for today, because tomorrow might be a little hard for you, Zarif said, getting another nod from his apprentice. The apprentice started walking toward his room, which had a magic circle that would send him to his apartment, while muttering about how he would have to deal with Sasaki's anger tomorrow. As Zarif spoke softly enough that his apprentice could not hear, he said, I think the Uchiha will be the least of your concerns. The Dark Lord wanted to tell Naruto everything he knew about how interested his family was in him, but he thought this would be a good test for the young blonde, one of control and hearth. Let's see how you handle them, Naruto. Kun, especially now that you've accepted your own inner demons, Zarif said in a low voice. He then sat back down on the floor with his eyes closed, knowing that this was a test for his young apprentice. For his own safety and the safety of the village, he really hoped that his apprentice could stay in charge. That last part didn't seem to bother Zarif very much, though. In the meantime, Naruto. Isn't this nice? Were the sarcastic words our young hero said to himself when he looked in the bathroom mirror of his apartment. As soon as the young mage got to his apartment, the first thing he wanted to do was eat something. 
Unfortunately, the only thing in his fridge was some instant ramen, which didn't satisfy his hunger. Since it was already late, as his sensei had told him, he chose to take a shower and go to bed early. It wasn't until after her shower that the young blonde finally looked at herself in the bathroom mirror. First, his hair had changed a little. His golden locks hadn't changed all that much, but the two bangs that normally framed his face were now black, the same color as his sensei's hair. His eyes had also changed a little. They were now a darker shade of blue instead of their usual sky. Blue color, but Naruto thought the biggest change was that his whisker marks were gone. Naruto said to himself as he put on his sleepwear, which was just a black shirt and shorts, great, more things to explain to Sasaki and Shikamaru, though that guy probably won't even bother to ask anything because he thinks it would be too much trouble. But before he went to sleep, the young blonde sat down in his bed and thought about everything that had happened with his shadow. This made Naruto think about what he found, or more accurately, what he accepted, after defeating his shadow. He knew that even though he stopped caring about his blood relatives, there was still a part of him that hated them for not taking care of him. He had been denying that part of him the whole time, thinking that when he stopped caring about them, he also stopped hating them. I should have known better, Naruto thought, upset that he thought he was free of angry feelings when he thought about his old family. His meeting with his darkness had made it clear that there was still a part of him that wanted to punish his blood relatives for not taking care of him, but he wouldn't. He wouldn't let the anger and hatred his family cause control his future or turn him into a monster. He wasn't sure if he would ever let go of his anger and hatred toward his former family. It was too strong in his heart at this point. But he had already lived 14 years without them, and he now had a family in Zirf, so he didn't see the point in letting it go or forgiving them. They had already gone 14 years without caring about him, so why would they care if he hated them or forgave them? They wouldn't, Naruto thought. He decided he didn't need them at all. Zarif was his family, not them, so why should he care about forgiving them when they didn't care about him? The young blonde decided he could live his life as it was. It was too late to change anything now, even if his family missed him or wanted him back in their perfect family. As if, were the last words Naruto said to himself before he finally fell asleep. He was thinking about how silly it was that his family might actually be paying attention to him. He should have known. The next day, our blonde hero could be seen walking through the halls of the academy. He was grumpy for two reasons, he had to stay here for two more months, and he woke up later than usual, so he's now late for class. Since it was getting late, the young blonde decided to just use the body flicker technique, shushin no jutsu, that he had learned from some scrolls in the library. He showed up outside the academy and then decided to walk to his classroom because he wasn't missing anything important. When the young Zarif apprentice finally got to his classroom, he didn't expect anyone to stop what they were doing and just stare at him. This included the students and the teacher, whose name, if Naruto remembers correctly, is Iruka Amino, a chunin. The teacher was doing the best imitation of a fish Naruto had ever seen by opening and closing his mouth but not moving his jaw. It seems like something is wrong, sensei. How did the scarred chunin get rid of the lump that seemed to have formed in Naruto's throat? He asked politely, his voice shaking. Who is Naruto Uzumaki? Namikaze? Asked the chunin, which made Naruto blink twice. He didn't think that the changes in his hair and face were that noticeable for the teacher to question his identity. He had missed a week of class, but he wasn't a very active student to begin with, so why the sudden reaction? Yes. Is something wrong? I answered Naruto, and right on cue, three figures appeared around him. Naruto tensed up as soon as the figures appeared, and he mentally scolded himself for not sensing them sooner. But it was too late for that. At this point, all he could do was think about what the ANBUs wanted with him. Who is Naruto Uzumaki, Namikaze? Why are you here? Asked the Anbu with silver hair and a dog mask. Naruto almost rolled his eyes. He was sure he had just answered the question, which was why they were there in the first place. Naruto replied, yes. His mind was racing as he tried to figure out why the ANBUs were there to help him. Could someone have found out something about his sensei or the training room? No, that was impossible. He made sure no one was following him in the first place, and the room was very well hidden. What did they want? Someone with black hair and a weasel mask said, Uzumaki. Namikaze. Sama, Hokage. Sama has called you. You must come with us. Even though Naruto tried to hide it, 
he became even more suspicious when the word, Hokage, was used. He wasn't excited to see his ex. Father. He just hoped this could end quickly and without revealing anything important. Fine, Naruto said, wanting to get this over with quickly. As soon as he did, the third Anbu, who was the only woman among them and wore a snake mask, put her hand on his shoulder and disappeared with him in a Sunshin no Jutsu, body flicker technique. Her two friends did the same thing a second later, and they were on their way to the Hokage office, where the Hokage and his wife were very worried about finding their missing son. Naruto didn't have time to notice how his classmates reacted when he walked into the classroom. The most common reaction was confusion, followed by surprise. But there were some interesting ones, like Shikamaru's, whose face was full of suspicion, or Hanada Hayuga's, whose face was a mix of happiness and relief, though that expression changed as soon as she thought of a certain memory. Of course, Naruto didn't see the annoyed look and glare that Menma gave him or the happy look that Sasaki had on her face when he walked in. Although, that happy look turned into worry when she saw the ANBUs take her blonde friend. He also missed the one tear that had fallen from his sister's eye. Hello, Oni. San. A short time ago, the Hokage's office. Sadness, regret, self. Hatred, and hopelessness were all thoughts that were going through the minds of Kashina Uzumaki, who used to be the Jinchuriki of the Kiyubi no Kitsune and was also the strongest ninja in Konoha. That's because, for the past week, these two ninjas have been looking for Naruto, their first child, who has been missing. Oh no. Where is Minato? Kun? Almost yelled Kashina, whose normally violet eyes were now red and puffy from crying so much. It had been a week since Orochimaru talked to them about their son, and they planned to make things right with their firstborn the very next day. Yes, Minato had a very clear memory of that day. Last week. The next day after Orochimaru came to visit, you could find Minato and Kashina sitting in their living room again, thinking about what they had said to Orochimaru. The 2S. Rank Shinobi first decided that they would do everything they could to get back in touch with their son as soon as possible. That's why they got up extra early today. Naruto would be a part of their family's training time, which was one of the first things they changed. Minato and Kashina decided that today, even though it was a school day, their children would not go. This was because they wanted to show their firstborn child that he was an important part of the family and that they loved him. So that this would work, they told their other children first. They thought that their help would make Naruto feel like he was part of the family. They were both waiting for their kids to come down so that they could tell them that their brother was now training with them. Of course, both parents were worried that Naruto probably wasn't as strong as Menma or Mito. But then Orochimaru's words about Naruto hiding his strength and easily beating Sasaki Uchiha came to mind, and they decided that today was a good time to find out if Naruto really did have some kind of secret skills. After waiting for a while, their three kids, Menma, Mito, and Natsumi, finally came down to the living room. Their youngest child looked sleepy, while Menma and Mito looked more confused, since their parents hadn't woken them up that early. Parents of the Uzumaki Namikaze children stood and looked at their three children with a mix of pride and sadness. Menma was dressed normally for school. He had on a blue shirt with no sleeves, black ambu pants, and blue ninja sandals. He wore a white high collar jacket over his shirt. The back of the jacket had the Uzumaki symbol in red. Mito wore a short sleeved purple blouse that looked like a kimono and had a darkly embroidered border that hugged her B. Cup breasts. She wore a dark skirt, stockings that reached her thighs, and blue ninja sandals. On the back of her blouse, just like her brother, there was a symbol of the Uzumaki clan. She sat between her brother and sister and was the last person on the list. She was also wearing a short, sleeved mesh shirt, dark blue shorts, and blue shinobi sandals. The top of her outfit was a kimono, style blouse with no sleeves that was black and orange enclosed with a deep blue obi. The three Uzumaki. Namikaze children were looking at their parents. Menma had his arms crossed, and Mito had her hands on her lap. They were both interested in what their parents wanted so quickly. Natalie, on the other hand, was still rubbing her eyes with her hands and trying her best to stay awake. She usually slept a little more than her brother and sister. Children, yesterday your father and I made a decision that I'm sure will help our family a lot. With a loving smile, Kashina spoke to her children. Then she looked at her husband and gave him a small nod, telling him to go on. We decided that starting today, your brother will be training with us. Minato said with a carefree smile. 
He was expecting a lot of reactions from his three kids, but he didn't expect the ones he saw. Menma's eyes grew wide with surprise, but then they turned irritated, showing that he wasn't at all amused by the news. Mito's eyes also got bigger when she heard the news. Then she lowered her gaze and began mumbling something that no one could hear. Natsumi, on the other hand, looked confused before putting one finger to her chin, which showed that she was thinking about something. Menma finally spoke out about what he thought, and neither Minato nor Kashina were ready for what he said. Why do we have to train with that jerk? It was very angry of Menma to say that her brother was only going to bring us down. He didn't want to waste his training time because her brother couldn't even throw a kanai right. Menma didn't pay attention to the cold looks his sister Mito gave him, but it was clear that what he said was wrong because both of his parents gave him a mild glare. At the same time, his little sister still had the same look of thought that she had before, which made her look cuter if you asked anyone. Hey, Menma. That's not how you should talk about your brother. Kashina told her in a harsh voice, her hands on her hips and a furious look on her face. But it's true. That loser probably can't even fight well. He barely wins his spars with kids from the outside world, so you haven't seen him in the academy. He is so weak. The more he spoke, the louder his voice got. Of course he didn't want to train with his loser brother. He needed to get stronger, and having his weak brother pick on him while they trained with their parents would not help him at all. Menma that's enough. It doesn't matter if Naruto is behind you in training. He's still your brother and you will treat him with the respect he deserves. Minato yelled at one of his sons for talking badly about his brother. Menma looked like he was about to say something else to his parents, most likely something bad about his brother based on what he had already said. But he was stopped by his sister Mito's cold voice and then turned around. The young redhead threatened, shut up, Menma, before you say something that won't let you train for the day. Her violet eyes were looking right into her brother's blue ones, and Menma found himself gasping at the look she gave him. After all, an angry Uzumaki girl was the only thing that really scared Menma and Minato. No matter how much his life depended on it, Menma would never say it. After letting out at TCH, and making a mean face, the young blonde Jinchuri Kiki of the Kiyubi just turned his back on her. With a raised eyebrow, Mito turned his attention from his brother to his parents. Ka. San, too. San, not that I'm against it but why the change? The question made Mito wonder why her parents wanted to train her Oni. San since they never did anything interesting for him. When Minato and Kashina heard this question, they both looked sad. The shame they felt for forgetting one of their children was still fresh in their minds, and they knew it would probably go away completely soon. With a sad smile, Minato looked at his wife and then at his children and said, We were told we made a mistake, and we're trying to fix it, Mito. Chan. He then put his arm around Kashina, who looked like she was about to cry again. The young woman with the red hair seemed happy with the answer and decided not to bring it up again for now, but she couldn't stop thinking about how her oni. San would react to this, which made her feel bad. Her only hope was that Oni. San would get strong enough to defend himself. Mito gently shook her head to get rid of those thoughts. Every time she thought about her brother, she remembered the choice she made when she was seven years old and how bad she has felt ever since. Ka. Chan how does Naruto? Oni. Chan looks like? Asked Natsumi out of the blue with an innocent look on her face. This made Minato and Kashina's eyes widen and Menma and Mito raise an eyebrow. Actually, Natsumi had been trying to remember her other brother's name since the beginning of the conversation. It was only now that she remembered Naruto's name, let alone what he looks like, which made her angry. To be fair, she does forget she has another brother sometimes because she hasn't talked to him in years. They both looked scared at each other because it seemed like their relationship with Naruto wasn't the only one that was at best bad. Menma seemed mad at him for something, but Natsumi couldn't even remember who he was. The person in the family who seemed to have the best relationship with Naruto was Mito. However, Orochimaru said that relationship wasn't very good either. This made Minato and Kashina feel even worse about their feelings. They had been such bad parents that they had forgotten about one of their kids and didn't even know how Naruto had cut himself off from his family. They promised their son again that they would make things right with him no matter what. The redhead with the oldest hair let out a sigh and then smiled at her kids, but Mito and Menma could tell that her smile was stiff. Why don't you go wake up Naruto? Kun so that we can start the day? Minato asked his daughter, Natsumi. He was trying to change the subject because he couldn't just tell her that he and Kashina didn't know for sure what their son looked like. 
Little Natsumi smiled and nodded, then practically skipped up the stairs to the second floor of the house while the rest of the family waited in the living room. But this seemed like the right thing to say. Before they did anything else today, Minato and Kashina wanted to talk to Naruto to let him know they loved him and were sorry they hadn't shown it more often. Natsumi came back to the living room after only a few minutes, but she did so with a shy look on her face and without her brother. What happened, Natsumi? Chan? Kashina asked her daughter as she walked up to her. Her voice was full of worry. I didn't want to wake Naruto. Oni. Chan up because I didn't want to make him mad at me, Natsumi said in a shy voice that wasn't like her at all. I'm sure Naruto. Kun won't get mad at you for that Natsumi. Chan, but why don't we all go to wake him up? A loving smile spread across Minato's youngest daughter's face as he spoke. But in the back of his mind, the thought of not knowing how his son would react almost made him let out a sigh. That answer got another happy nod from Natsumi, who led not only her parents but also Mito, who was very interested in seeing Naruto's room, and Menma, who came along because he had nothing else to do. When the Uzumaki Namikaze family got to Naruto's room, Minato was the one who knocked on the door. He was waiting for his son to open it or say something. There was silence for a moment before Minato knocked on the door again. The same thing happened this time, which made Kashina a little worried. Kashina knocked on the door and said, Naru. Kun, it's time to wake up. Just like when her husband did, she got no answer, which made her look at him a little worried, but he just nodded and sighed, thinking that his wife was being a little too dramatic. The oldest man in the family said, Naruto. Kun, we're going in, and then he opened the door to Naruto's room. What they saw was not what they were expecting. In simple terms, the room was empty. It only had a bed, a bookcase with no books in it, and a wooden desk that was empty. There were no posters or anything else on the walls that would have led you to believe that a 14. Year. Old boy lived there. Kashina and Minato were both scared and busy because of this. As they walked around the room, Minato noticed that the bookcase and desk were both dusty, which meant that no one had used the room in a while. That's not possible, Minato thought, sharing his wife's worries about Naruto even more. But what Natsumi said next really scared the two adults to tears. Where's Naruto? Oni. Chan? That was correct. Naruto wasn't in this room at all. In fact, there was no sign that he lived here at all. They didn't have to say a word to know what the other person was thinking when they looked at each other. Where did their son go? Back in the Hokage's office, a few minutes before Naruto was picked up by the ANBUs. This is when Minato felt completely lost and said, I. I don't know Kushi. Chan, as he held his crying wife. When he and Kashina saw that Naruto wasn't in his room, the first thing they thought was that he had either gotten up even earlier than them and gone out, or he had stayed at a friend's house, which Orochimaru had told them was only Sasaki Uchiha's because she was Naruto's only friend. They sent both Mito and Menma to the academy and told them to tell their brother to go home with them as soon as they saw him. Mito agreed right away, but Menma complained about brothers who don't do anything for you. Although it took some work, Minato was able to convince Kashina to stay home with Natsumi. They couldn't leave her alone, and she wasn't starting school until next year, so only the Hokage went to the Uchiha district, specifically to the house of Fugaku Uchiha, the head of the Uchiha clan. The person who met him there was Makoto Uchiha, who was a good friend of his and Natsumi's godmother. The first thing he asked was if Naruto, his son, had slept here the night before. Makoto told him that he hadn't, and she didn't even know that Naruto was friends with her daughter. While she knew that Sasaki had a secret friendship with someone, she would usually tease her daughter by saying it was a crush, which made Sasaki very angry and gave her a heavy blush. Makoto never knew who this boy was, but she had a feeling that her oldest son, Itachi, did. He then tried to calm down Kashina, who was yelling about all the crazy things that could have happened to her little Naru. Kun, by telling her what Makoto had told him. Seriously, every time Kashina said it, the thought of some evil, crazy person from another world taking his son made him sweat. And Minato told her that he was probably at the academy. He also said that when he got home with Mito and Menma, they would all talk about where he had been and why his room looked the way it did. Of course, they never talked about that because both Menma and Mito told Naruto's family that he missed class today when they got home from school. Not only did this worry Kashina, but it also worried Minato.
he quickly called the ANBUs and told them to go find his son as soon as possible. Kakashi Hitaki was in charge of the ANBUs, and Minato really hoped that they could quickly find Naruto. Kashina looked worse than she ever had. But she wasn't the only one who was worried. Natsumi and Mito were also worried, even though Mito pretended not to be. Menma would say he didn't care, though, if you asked him. Things went from bad to worse after the first day of not seeing or hearing Naruto at all. It was up to Minato to find their son in all of Konoha and the area around the village, even in the Forest of Death. They put together different search parties. A lot of ninjas, like Orochimaru and Tsunade of the Sanin, who didn't have an urgent mission were thrown into the search groups. I think Jiraiya would have helped too, but he wasn't in the village at the time. The blonde Hokage remembered very well how his wife almost killed Orochimaru when he said Naruto had left the village as he had said he would. It took both him and Tsunade to stop the angry redhead from seriously hurting the pale Sanin, but the redhead just looked at them with a face that said, I told you so. After all of their hard work, they still couldn't find any sign of Naruto. This was true even with the help of different Konoha clans, such as the Inazuka and the Aburame, who were known for being very good at tracking. And yes, the search has been going on for a whole week now. Minato didn't want to admit it, but the chances of finding his son didn't look good. But he couldn't tell his wife that because he knew that giving up would make things worse for the Uzumaki women, who were already in a lot of pain and blamed themselves for their son's disappearance. If she had only paid more attention to him, things might not have gone so badly. In the same way, Minato felt the same way. But they couldn't do anything but wait to see if Naruto showed up and then figure out how to fix their relationship with their son. The blonde Hokage was distracted when an Anbu with silver hair that looked like gravity and a dog mask showed up. Minato knew right away that it was his last living student. His words, on the other hand, made both him and his wife feel better. We found him. Coming back to Naruto. Before becoming a genin, if someone had told Naruto that he would be standing in front of the doors to the Hokage office while being watched by two ANBUs, there were three, but one went in to report first, he would have thought that person was crazy. Unfortunately for him, that was the case right now, when he was waiting for his ex father to lead him into the Hokage's office. Naruto thought they were going very fast. Since he had the week off, he thought it was probably the reason. But he was sure that his biological parents would be the last people in the village to notice that he wasn't there, even if it was only for a week. But it looked like he was wrong. That didn't bother him, though. At this point, he didn't care what Minato wanted. He just wanted this to end as soon as possible so he could train for a while at the academy or on a training ground. The young blonde was taken out of Naruto's mind by a voice he knew to be Minato's. As it seemed like it was now his turn to go in, he did so with a neutral face, walking into the Hokage's office. He was slightly surprised to see not only Minato but also his biological mother, Kashina, there, and he had to admit that she looked particularly awful. When Minato and Kashina finally saw their son, their eyes grew wide with surprise. After all, the way he looked had caught them off guard. They first noticed that he was pretty tall for his age, they were pretty sure he was a few inches taller than Menma. They also noticed that his hair was spiked and blonde, like Minato and Menma's, but it had two black bangs that framed his face. The last thing they saw was that some of his whisker marks were still there, which made him look even more like Minato than before. The said Hokage was about to say something when his wife stopped him. She was too happy to hold back her tears of joy at finally seeing her Sochi. After all, the first thing Naruto heard when he walked in was his mother yelling, Naru. Kun. She had already run over to him with her arms wide open, ready to give him a hug that would break his bones. Naruto didn't notice this, of course. Seeing a woman running at him made him think of someone who had caused him emotional pain when he was a child. He wasn't sure if it was because of his training with Zeref or just his natural reflex, but just as the red. Haired women were about to hit him, he moved out of the way at a speed that had to be at least chunin. Level. Kashina missed her hug and turned to see her son, her eyes showing a range of emotions that Naruto didn't notice. I don't know what you were trying to do there, Uzumaki. San, but please don't do it again, Naruto said in a cold, emotionless voice. Kashina and Minato both jumped when they heard that tone. In the end, Minato was the first to react because Kashina's eyes were still on Naruto and she looked scared, likely from what Naruto had said and done. Minato scolded Naruto in a stern voice, that's not how you should talk to your mother. But it didn't seem to bother the young blonde. 
The blonde's eyes now moved from the still redhead to him. I promise you, Hokage. Sama, that I'll treat her with the respect she deserves, Naruto said in the same cold voice. He looked like he didn't feel anything, but he was confused and angry inside. He was confused by how they treated him and mad at Minato for trying to correct him for everything. Like he had the right to do that. Naru. Kun. Kashina whispered, as if Naruto's words had hurt her. The head of the Uzumaki. Namikaze family tried to get close to her son, but Naruto took a step back, ready for what she or Minato might do. Naruto didn't trust either of them, so he would be ready for anything. Naruto pushed the conversation forward in the end. He had more important things to do than hang out with people he didn't care about. I was told you needed me to be there, Hokage. Sama. I'm guessing this meeting has something to do with where I've been this week, Naruto asked, his voice and face not showing any emotion. The oldest blonde had to blink a few times before he could think of the question. Yes, Naruto. Kun, that is the reason for this, Minato said and his voice grew calmer. Where were you, Naruto? Kun? You made us all worried. We've been looking for you all week. Minato asked, wondering where in the name of Kami his son had been all week. What did Minato say that made Naruto raise an eyebrow? Were they worried about him? Well that's a first, Naruto thought. When the ANBUs asked him to help, he chose to tell the lie he had been thinking. I was training, Naruto said with his arms crossed in front of his chest. His voice and face were exactly the same as Zerif's when he doesn't show any emotion. This time, Kashina almost yelled, but where? Though Naruto didn't respond, his eyes went straight from his biological father to the red. Haired beauty. The forest of death was Naruto's answer, which made both parents gasp. They knew about the forest of death. In fact, almost every ninja in the village did. They also knew how dangerous it was. To be honest, Orochimaru and his apprentice Anko Mitarashi were the only ones who liked being there. Kashina and Minato both had a lot of different feelings, which wasn't a surprise. For Minato, he felt both proud and disappointed. He was proud that his son was strong enough to train there, which proved Orochimaru's theory that he was hiding skills. But he felt disappointed that he hadn't been the one to help his son with his training. At the same time, Kashina was confused, just like her husband. One part of her felt relieved that her Sochi seemed to be safe again, but another part of her was furious at him for going to such a dangerous place when he wasn't even a genin yet. Kashina said, what? What were you thinking Naru? Kun? You could have gotten hurt or even died there. Naruto didn't show that her outburst made him change his mind. One thing he did was turn his attention from Minato to Kashina. His dark blue eyes were fixed on her. His voice was as cold as ice as he said, I don't see how where I train is any of your business, Uzumaki. San. As Kashina looked straight into Naruto's cold blue eyes, she said, of course is my concern, Sochi. How could you think it's not? I was worried sick about you. I thought something had happened to you. Minato, who was now standing next to his wife with a hand on her shoulder and a sad smile on his face, said, Naruto. Kun, we're your parents. Your safety and happiness will always be our top priority, so please don't think that we don't care. This was not going well at all, Minato thought. Naruto did seem to be angry at them after all. Naruto lowered his head a little after hearing those words. His hair fell over his eyes, and he spoke some quiet but strong words. You aren't. Kashina asked with a frown, what? He felt like something really bad was about to happen. She was so right. Naruto looked directly at both Minato and Kashina and said, you aren't my parents. If that was possible, his voice and eyes became even colder than before. Kashina, who couldn't believe what her son was saying, asked, W. What? What are you saying, Sochi? Even Minato couldn't say anything because of what he said and how hard he said it. He was, at the very least, angry when he said, I said that you are not my parents. He was still thinking about the fight he had with his shadow, and now these two were trying to do something similar. Naruto wouldn't let them. He would tell them how he really felt. A father is not someone that ignores his son. A mother is not someone who neglects her child. A father is not someone that forgets about his son first day at the academy. A mother is not someone that forgets about her son's birthday for 14 years. A father is not someone that locks the house while his son is still outside, forcing him to sleep in the streets. A mother is not someone that never believes her child, 
calling him a liar every time he tells her how some drunk passerby attacks him. Parents are not people who, for 14 years had never show one ounce of love towards their child, said Naruto in a calm and cold voice. Gay's finally appearing on his face and his fist tightening rage. They have no right to say they are his parents. They never stood by him. Zarif was the only one who did. He's the only one he can call family, not these two strangers in front of him. At the same time, Naruto's words left both Minato and Kashina speechless. It was a heavy blow for all of them. Were they really that bad at raising him? Had they really failed so badly that they made their own son feel that way? That was the worst way for both Minato Namikaze and Kashina Uzumaki to feel. They were like scum, trash, and real shit. Naruto said that. As he walked toward the door. He didn't want to be here, and if things keep going this way, he'll do something he hates. He had to calm down before his magic went off or something worse happened. Is the reason why you aren't my parents. We may be related by blood, but that's all we have in common. For me you are nothing but strangers, people whose lives I couldn't care less about. He was glad that neither Minato nor Kashina tried to stop the young blonde from opening the door. He didn't care. He just wanted to leave this place right now because he had too many things to think about. But before he left, he had one more thing to say to them. He wanted them to know where they were standing in relation to him so that something like this would never happen again. I have lived 14 years without your care, support or love. What makes you think I want that now? After that, he left. So that's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel for more awesome stories like this. Thank you. See you all in my next video.